So welcome to another episode of Comic Book Historians. Today we have a special guest, Tim Sale. I'm here with my trusty co-host, Jim Thompson. Jim, how you doing? You shouldn't trust me, Alex. <laughs> I'm a lawyer. Don't yeah, he's a, I never trust, trust never me. trust lawyers, ladies and gentlemen, but I do trust Jim, though. Today we're with Tim Sale, a comic book author and artist for the past 30 or so years. He has both an extremely talented visual storytelling ability and also a historical perspective as he does make comic book history commentary on social media, which is always fascinating to read. Tim, thank you so much for joining us today. Sure, my pleasure. I want to start from the beginning. You were born in 1956. Yeah. You were born in New York when you were six years old. Your father bought... Well, he wasn't born in New York when he was six years old. No, that's well, also a true statement. Well done. Lawyers, you know, you got to watch was, out. I was born in Ithaca, New York. In Ithaca, okay. Which is my father's hometown. His father was an English professor and taught at Cornell. Hmm. And uh, when my father... Well, when we became a family, uh, we moved to Amherst, Massachusetts. And my dad was a very young, very uh, cocky professor of English at, at Amherst. Mm-hmm. Oh, well. And that was my first six years. Mm-hmm. I don't remember. I, I, we moved from Ithaca when I was three weeks old. Mm-hmm. You know, so mm-hmm. Amherst was my growing up period. Mm-hmm. And when you were six, you guys moved to the West Coast. Yeah. And your father bought your first comics for you. Yeah, to amuse me in the car, because we drove, <laughs> uh-huh. and he didn't know anything about them. He knew I liked adventure stuff, Yeah. so like um, Mizarro and Robin Hood, all these vigilante, semi-costumed, uh, hero- heroic people. Uh-huh. Uh, a lot of, some of that was Disney. So these are like Dell comics uh, from well, 1961? No, he didn't, he didn't. No, I don't think he bought me... Those kind of comics. He uh-huh. bought me superhero comics, but he, he might have bought me Millie the Model too. I don't, I don't know. I see. But what I can tell you is that when I was in my twenties, at some point, I went to a spinner rack and found a reprint of Amazing Spider-Man Annual Number Two. Did go uh, Doctor Strange. Did go and Lee the Terrible Tinkerer was one right. of the backup. And that's a classic issue, by the way. Uh, it absolutely is. Yeah. On many levels. Mm-hmm. And I, I had this intense wave of nostalgia. Right. Oh. I almost said nausea, but uh, in nostalgia. And I figured out that that was one of the books that Dad had bought me. A Proustian kind of thing, where it brought in yeah. that, that, that feeling of, yeah. in that way. And looking at the, less so the Terrible Tinkerer story, although it is a wonderful one. And I did a remark of the Terrible Tinkerer last year in a sketchbook, one of my sketchbooks. That's in the side note. Mm-hmm. But it was so much fun to draw. Yeah. The whiskers coming out of his nose and all that shit. Um, sorry, can I swear? Yeah, yeah. you can, you okay. can swear. Um, and he's really uh, ugly. Uh, Tinker is, well, Ditko, of course, yeah. it's, it's... Those it's eyebrows that. are like yeah. this. But the... You just can't improve on the on the Doctor Strange story. It's just everything about it is amazing. Yeah, true. Um, Those two stories, both Annual One and Annual Two, are like in terms of dead code. Those are just tour de forces. Pretty prime. Mm-hmm. Both of those splash pages on Annual in One, one yeah. are just are incredible. They are right. Yeah, he has like a a punchline to each of those battles with those single pages. They're incredible. Ditko's Doctor Strange, too. I mean, the, that was amazing. That was pioneer stuff. Yeah, that was distilled down. I mean, the, there's more of a formula to the annual one. Yeah. Because you've got to get all the villains in. He's got to fight all the villains separately. And right. Defeat all of them. But separately. each fight is so differently framed. Yeah. That oh, it's, no. It's, it's extremely well done. It's well done, yeah. But it's a, still a formula. Kind yeah, of that's thing. true. And there's nothing predictable sure. about the, the sequel. Doctor Strange one. Without Spidey, it's a great, strange story. True. Yeah. Anyway. And I, I ripped off a couple of those pictures in Spider-Man Blue. By the way. Nice. Some of the, okay. Some of the punches and uh-huh. stuff like that. So that was my father's contribution to my career, mm-hmm. as it were. Mm-hmm. But always, as I said earlier, I, I've been attracted to uh, adventure fiction, mm-hmm. especially heroic. And uh, without recognizing it, people wearing costumes, mm-hmm. masks. Right. 
not everything is as wimpy as the Scarlet Pimpernel. I mean, there's a lot, <laughs> lot of really good stuff out there. Uh-huh, yeah. Later on, it became things like the Count of Monte Cristo and just thrilling, uh, mysterious. Oh, I see. So not necessarily super superpowers, uh, but no, the costume, no, the, the adventure. The powers were always less interesting to me. Yeah, right. Or not the point. Mm-hmm. I should right. say that. Good. Yeah, Because yeah. a guy who can walk up walls is pretty great. Mm-hmm. Because I know your your age compared to mine. Which is what, we should say? Three years. I'm three years younger than you. I remember going in Walden Books, and I had not read any Edgar Rice Burroughs, but those Frazetta covers of that time, those just knocked me out, too, in terms yeah. of... That, that kind of thing. And, yeah. and, and was, do you, were those, and now you're like, what, you're like a not, teenager not, at not, that not point. Not Burroughs, but Conan. Yeah. Well, it was Conan for you? Oh, boy, that mm. Conan with Samaria number three, where the Frost Giants one in the blue. Yeah, it's a beautiful one. That one just knocks me out. But so those. There's too many to mention. I, yeah. Just an amazing array. And I, I remember that. Faked or not, there was a letter in a Silver Surfer issue where somebody posits, wouldn't it be great to have, and it's a terrible idea, uh, have <laughs> Conan meet the Silver Surfer. And, uh, and, and, That's and they, like colliding uh, genres right there. And they said, uh, the Sumerian and the Surfer. That is a great title. Yeah. And, and, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think it was Roy who was answering right. the letters at that point. But Roy obviously was interested in Conan and Howard, and so he wanted to respond. He wrote about it, and I said, "Well, I got to check this out." And I, I went and I found the the red cape with with the ape oh, yep. cover. Oh yeah, and I said, "Jeez," <laughs> and that was amazing. And again, I'm fourteen, fifteen. Yeah, and I couldn't believe that they didn't. They were a fight scene, and they didn't stop. When it's kind of like porn, when it's soft porn, and you know, yeah, you know, they didn't stop. And yeah, they kept so, going. So Conan plucked out this guy's eyeball, and he broke his back, and you know, I mean, just you know, wow, like, whoa. <laughs> and I, <laughs> I never heard the porn analogy, but yeah, I could see that. Well, you don't, you know, I'm not saying I relate to it. You, but you, I, you yeah. don't, you don't cut to the fireplace when the good stuff starts. <laughs> Right. <laughs> Robert, e. How- Robert E. Howard didn't cut to the fireplace. Right. Yeah, that's true. And I, I just love the pulp of it. I was just right at the right age for all that. And uh, I had an Eisenhower jacket. It's four pockets inside and out. And each one had a paperback in it. And much it, of Conan. And, oh, really? And, uh, most, a lot of the pages where the good scenes were, <laughs> I dogged it down. <laughs> so if I had to wait for a bus or if I had anything spare time. Anyway. So there was there was that. How did I got into that? I don't but know. not Burroughs. Just no, never Burroughs. I've never read any Burroughs. Yeah, you've never drawn Tarzan. You never cared about any uh, that Cooper drawing, Tarzan is drawing a, Tarzan is a different thing. I haven't very much, yeah. but and I haven't drawn Conan very much. No, yeah. I was going to ask you that because I couldn't <laughs> recall if he did it. It was like well, a, some of that is just the intimidation of Frazetta. Right, right, right. I don't know that I have somebody to bring to it. One thing I want to segue toward. <coughs> so, who is who is your favorite um, Conan comic book artist? Not Buscema. Not Buscema. Okay, and you knew where I was seg- segueing to, obviously. There's so many. Right. Like, For that's a while, what I learned. it was Smith, but it's not Smith. Right. Although the Frost Giant's daughter is a is a great story. Perfect. That splash page is unbelievable. The double. Yeah. 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 And the storytelling in a lot of it is really great. Adams at times, not always. In comics, I, there isn't no one that I really There's like. no one favorite. No. So one thing I want to kind of segue to is the next stage is you were at University of Washington for a while. Then you um, left University of Washington, took some classes, John Buscema classes at the um, New York School of Visual Arts. What led to that change? No, no. He had his own workshop. Workshop, okay. That he created. Yes. It was not at the School of Visual Arts. I see. Oh, it was the one that he did himself. Oh, yes. I see. Okay. I also was enrolled in the School of Visual Arts at the same time. Okay. But I almost never went. Right. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I was really there for the workshop. I see. Okay. And that was three months long, three different illustrators, uh, three different um, teachers, and 
each one once a week would give a lecture and with demonstrations. The first one was Buscema, and he taught anatomy, chain smoke camels or whatever, mm-hmm. the whole thing. Second one was Ramita. He taught inking and storytelling. And the third one was Marie Severin. She taught cover design and storytelling. Mm. Holy crap. That's an amazing three. I mean, that, that I threesome is something. And, and it is often the case in real life, the real talents, not that Severin is not, was not talented. She certainly was. The real talents were not that good teachers. Mm, yeah. She was the better teacher. Mm-hmm. And she took a shine to me and she uh, invited me up to uh, the bullpen. Oh, really? Murray did? Cool. Yeah. And I think Shooter was the head, Jim of, Shooter? The head of the bullpen then. What year? Wait, so that was like 70, 76. 76. Okay. So that was probably Archie Goodwin. Maybe. Maybe I'm wrong. I know. I don't know. I'm not don't, sure. Yeah. I don't think so. Okay. 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 And Marie had seen some of my ink wash stuff. Yeah. Which I don't know how. Really. Not published yet, right? No. I mean, just just no. seen it. I don't know. She must have asked. I, I can't remember. And they had people doing in, in the black and white comics. They would just come in and do like light tone over inks, uh-huh. ink wash. Yeah. Like, oh, wow. Pablo Marcos. Uh huh. Yeah. yeah. You know that kind of. Flood was doing stuff only from his his pencils at that point for like Planet of the Apes and things. Really? Yeah, yeah. They were and Tom Sutton too. They were doing it directly. They weren't even inking it at that point. No, it was reproduced from the pencils. Yeah, reproduced from the pencils. Actual pencil? Yeah. So not grease paint, grease pencil, or I. My understanding is okay. that with both of those, they were doing pencils. Okay. Reproduction. I could be wrong. You're more a tech guy than. Obviously. Well, Adams did some of that in the in the Keeping Eerie stuff. Oh yeah, that's the true. first issue of Vampirella, a great story with the artist in the in the studio, and he looks out the yep by the sea, and this vixen comes out of the water. Yeah, <laughs> that's all pencil. Right, right. Those are some pretty bizarre stories, by the way. Whoever wrote those, that was kind of Ar- that's Archie. Oh, it was? Oh, yeah. Oh, that's cool. God, good one when he was doing the Warren stuff. That was, that was golden. That I motherfucker mean, did seven, there's seven stories yeah. in each one of those things. Right, right. And, and he, he did all those, huh? And he did oh. almost all the stories in all three of the books. Oh, that's cool. For at least three or four years. Yeah. And he was writing stuff like for Ditko that just nailed Ditko. Well, I talked to him about that. Um, to Goodwin? Yeah. Oh, please tell us about that, because that's that's awesome. Well, he was our editor on Long Halloween. Oh, that's right. And uh, he got sick during that. But he was also our editor for all the Batman stuff before, so all the Halloween specials. Archie was the editor on that. And he could draw, but he was more of a writer's editor. So he was extremely important for Jeff, who was still learning his ropes. And that's Jeff Lowe. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. But he would call and just give a note. You know that uh, panel where Batman shadows on the wall and he scares the villain and his cigarette jumps out of his mouth? That's great. <laughs> okay, see you later. Huh? But oh. you know that he'd looked at the book. Yeah. Yeah. Took him five minutes. Right. To yeah. give back something like that. Nobody does that. Right. Nobody yeah. did it then. Nobody does it now for sure. Wow. It's so clear in, in looking at those Warren Ditkos that he understood exactly well, what Ditko could do. It, that led to he, he and I having conversations because, not unlike you and me, Jim, I was a fan and a thoughtful fan of what he did and was very curious about his relationship. And he talked about, he was the first person I heard say this, and Jeff does this too, part of the job of a writer in comics is to know who your artist is and write to their strengths and away from their weaknesses. Right. And the easiest way to do that is to ask them what they want to do and what they don't want to do. And he would do that. So he would say to Toth, what do you feel like drawing? And Toth would say, an airplane fight in the sky. Right. And he'd write, yep. you know. Cause, cause or why wouldn't you have Toth do it? Well, what do you want to do? You you don't want to do that? What do you want to do? Uh, Subterranean creatures. Great. 
Sounds good. I'll yeah. come up with something. Right. That's cool. And, but for Ditko, you know, from, you just look at the things like the fly with the, the closed room story, the guy all bandaged, wrapped in bandages and, no? Yeah. Yeah. Compared to, uh, the ruby. Oh, the ruby is so good. You know, that's Ditko oh, saying, yeah. well, you know, that. oh no, hey, hey, mister, you want to buy a ruby? Right. And then well, those, it ends the, with the collector. Hey, with, buy the collector with those eye yeah, things no. that nobody was doing. I mean, like that was no. brilliant. So he went to the artist and said, "What do you want to do?" And that was half his job then at that point, because Archie was like eighteen when right. he got this job. Yeah, yeah. And his brain was just going a mile Constantly a minute. Going. So okay, I can do that. I can I can write something like that. Right. You're going to tell. You're going to be the genius in this. I'm just the guy helping. That's you. cool. Yeah, so, no, it was amazing. So now, and, and this is going to segue to the 80s with this particular question. So fun, So some of your first type work, it was non-superhero, and Jim's going to ask more about this, was a magic series called Myth Adventures in 1983. How did you get into that? Tell us a little bit about how you got into that. Um, I never heard of the, the books. There were a series of books uh-huh. that were popular. Right. And they were illustrated by a guy named Phil Folio. Uh-huh. The books were. The books. And the Peenies were traveling the country, going to comic book stores, because they were interested in expanding work graphics into mm. publishing things outside of ElfQuest. Mm. And I knew one of the managers of Golden Age Collectibles, which is mm. a local Seattle shop. And he called me and said, look, they're looking for anchors. Oh, that's great. And at that point, I thought, that's what I'm, I want to be as an anchor. Yeah. So you had a good relationship with those people at Golden Age Collectibles yeah. at the time. Yeah. Oh, okay. I've been there. That's a nice, that's a nice place. Yeah. So, so was that because you were not confident about your own storytelling? It absolutely really? was. Okay. I, when I came back from the workshop, I was sure I didn't know how to do it. Now, this was the, the Golden Age thing was eight years after coming back from New York. Right. So I'd uh, absorbed a lot of other stuff in between and just gotten older, figure stuff out. Uh, the black and white boom of which Elf Quest was a part was happening. And that and Sim were the two big ones. Right? Dave Sim was the biggest yeah. influence on me. But there were other, Tom McWeenie was doing some stuff that I just loved. And you're also a fan people. of Alex Toth, right? Yeah. But now, did you reach out to Sim at all? Did you ever have a project with uh, with Ardvark no. Van Hein? No, I no, I was too scared. But I don't know. I don't know that they were doing stuff like that. I wasn't aware that they were interested in publishing other stuff until later, because they or did Bob stuff, Burton and right. Okay. But that wasn't anything I was really interested in. I wasn't. That's not my kind of my niche of comics. Yeah, um, I'd seen Dave at. at shows and stuff like that. In fact, he was the first person I ever heard say this bit of wisdom, which is absolutely true to this day. He was being adored by fans somewhere. And he said, look, in here, I'm a superstar. I go out to lunch, nobody knows who the fuck I am. <laughs> I like it that way. You know, it, it, he didn't say Brad Pitt, let's, but let's say... Yeah, I, I get it. Yeah. He can't go out to lunch and nobody right. knows what he is. There's no darkness to hide in. And I thought that was great and smart. And uh, But his storytelling and the way, especially before Gerhard, I think I may have mentioned this on the board, on your board. I didn't read it after Gerhard came in. Oh, that's really interesting to me. I liked the high wire act of he wrote, penciled, inked, lettered a book a month. And he did that. For quite a while. And it was good. And he took a lot of shortcuts. I didn't care. I mean, it's like early Frank Miller, Daredevil. You know, people would say, oh, you can read it in 10 minutes. Yeah, but look at this. Right. There's nothing else like this out there. Yeah. Yeah, he could tell a story without words, really. Well, Sim was doing that constantly in that Epic Illustrated. He was doing Epic Illustrated Cerebus, and those were just without words storytelling, Mm -hmm. and it was brilliant. Well, there was a, a page recently on my fan page that uh, somebody posted that it, I guess it had just come up on eBay. And it was a Thieves World page. And it was so Cerebus. 
Oh, that you did? Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. It was that's uh, so funny. The establishing shot. First of all, it's all almost no backgrounds except for the establishing shot, and then it's black gutters all the way around. Well, not to the end of the page, but a black rectangle, and then black gutters within that. Right. Mm-hmm. So, which is so much of what Cerberus was because he he would just do he would sell out on one or two panels an issue, and the rest of it was people talking. And it was compelling. Right. Because he wrote it so goddamn well. Right. And you didn't care. that You didn't feel cheated. At least I didn't. No, he understood how to... He understood comics. And that... That that was a real difference maker to me. I'm with you. So that was that period. And and you were born in that moment. And and I want to say, to my segue into things... I was doing research today on, on, on your stuff, even though I know most of your stuff. And as I went through chronologically everything that, that you were doing in the eighties, right. it was like, I have all of it. And it's not because I was like immediately, I understood you. I didn't know who you were when you were doing Myth Adventures. It was that I was, I was alive in that particular moment where right, I, sure. I was just buying those things. And it was like, I got that, I got that, I got that. And it, it, it didn't stop until the 90s before I hit something that, like, I don't think I picked up that issue. I had everything you were drawing from the moment you started with Myth Adventures. And it's just so, like, I, I didn't even know. I knew once you did Challengers of the Unknown or maybe Amazon, where it's like, I know Tim Sale. But before that, I was still buying everything you were doing from the very, your birth, basically. And, and so I, I told Alex, I have to, I have to do the eighties because I have to talk to you about this stuff. Okay. And so, so starting with Myth Adventures, I read that first issue of Myth Adventures like a hundred times. I just thought this is the funniest thing I've ever read. And I was, you know, like, okay, I was 23 at, at this point and it just, you were inking it partly because you weren't confident. Were you, were you happy with it? Were you, were you like, what was your experience with doing that as a first project? Were you just happy to be there? Uh, I was broke, seriously broke, living with friends, living off of the friends. My rent was $100 a month and I couldn't make it. So there's that. So you were happy to um, get a paycheck. I sold out on my tryout, which is... I did a lot of cross hatching and a lot of stuff because they told me it was going to be black and white. And then I get 26 pages of pencil and, and Phil was working two up. Just Had he done comics or just illustrations at really. that point? No. So he was, he was not the, the teacher for a storytelling. Oh, he the- certainly was not. <laughs> um, and they gave me a week to, to ink that. Wow. 26 pages. And they expected what I did on the tryout, that level of cross etching. So every panel, a lot of stuff. And I did it. And pretty much from then on, the relationship between the peenies and, and folio and me just went in the can. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh. In the first issue, I fill it said, you know, that they go out in the blue woods and there's, okay, there's some trees. And I made them look like trees. And, or at least better than what he put down on the page. And that was a, an example of, and he said, look, you do this better than I do. It would be okay if you, if I left some stuff for you. <laughs> I said, sure. And I should have said, sure. You double my page, right? right. Because I'm paid ink, not to pencil. Right. Well, you were new. So anyway, it just got worse and worse. Mm. So that was sad. But he kept doing. In the meantime, I met Robert Asprin and Lynn Abbey. Wow! Because Asprin wrote the original right. Myth Adventure stuff, and I'd done some of my fantasy work and put it up in a fantasy art show that the that Asprin and Abbey attended, and they saw it, and they were looking for unbeknownst to me. They were looking for somebody to draw Thieves World, which was a popular... Right. And here's a guy who is naive and cheap, and we can probably get him for nothing. 
and they did. And they said to me, here's the only thing. You have to come to Ann Arbor, which is where we live, because we want to stand over you to watch and see what you do for the first your first book. Well, by that time, I was confident in my storytelling. And as I spoke to the Aspirins and also Laurie Sutton, who they poached from Epic. Mm. Yeah. Uh, yeah, with Archie, right? To be the, uh, you know, the, the seasoned head of judging what can go or what not go. I did a tryout page for her. She said, we would hire him at Epic if you're not going to get him. So then I had the gig. But at that point, I knew that I knew much more than they knew. Right. So you were making contacts. Is this where you made a contact with Matt Wagner, too? No, was that, that, that was later. Okay. That was after Thieves World when I realized, uh, look, I still got nothing. <laughs> Nobody knows what I do. And Laurie said, well, this guy named Mike Friedrich. Oh, yeah. We've been talking a lot from about From the that. 70s. And he created Star Reach. Yeah. And then became an agent. And Laurie said, why don't you contact him? I'll give you his information. And I did. And I sent him pages. And he said, I'll, I agree to represent you. First thing you need to do is come to San Diego. And this is back when it was a comic show. Yeah, not a, Tip- movie, not a movie show. So San Diego for the Comic-Con specific. It was only comic. Yeah. What year was that? Late 80s. Hmm. Okay. Okay. I did. That's where I met Matt Wagner, Diana Schutz, Bob Schreck. And through them, Jeff My Lope. first time. Second time, and that gave me work for five years. At oh, because cause Grendel. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Which is huge. It is. Yeah. It was. And also, they're all friends of mine. So that was a big thing, too. Wagner's awesome. He is. And it wasn't until the next year that I went and I met Barbara Kiesel, Barbara Randall at that point, not married to right. Carl. Carl. And she was partly there as a DC representative to look for talent. And I showed her some uh, pages that I'm still pretty proud of, actually. But nice. But they're uh, very love and rocketsy. No, oh, cool. Jamie or Berta? Oh, Jaime. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Jaime. Yeah, that's what I would. That would. But that kind of storytelling, and also three panels a page. A lot sure. of because he's. Ditko influenced and so <laughs> Actually, Beto did a story that was four panels on a page, and I said, that's a really clean way of telling, and and then three would be better. This is more, clean more is room a, for the art. You know? Clean is a very definition of both yeah. of those guys. Yeah. And Barbara said, well, it's very nice, Love and Rockets, but we don't publish on Love and Rockets. Um, we have a guy that Jeanette Kahn, who was the head of, DC at that point. Mm-hmm. She was very interested in uh, finding people from the movie TV world to come into comics. And Jeff was one of those people. And so she put us together. Oh, cool. Okay. Now and then we, we went looking for something to do. Was this before, this was after Comic Con or before Comic Con? Kamiko. Yeah. Because I'm, I'm thinking of Am- Amazon, obviously. But but the it other all stuff it too. all jumbles. Certainly, the published work, the first published work with Jeff was after a bunch of Kamiko stuff. Okay, after Kamiko. Because because boy, Amazon, I thought for me was the first time where like I, I had seen your Grendel, I had seen every method, obviously everything else you had done. But when you did that with C, uh, Siegel, Steve Siegel, S- Steve Siegel, when you did that, it was like. I saw what you were going to be to some degree. I, I, there was more space in it, and it was it was bigger. Well, it was beautiful. Here's the thing: um, Steve wrote that intentionally for three panels on a page, which is your wheelhouse, which is what you wanted to do. Because he had three voices going at one time that played off of each other. There was the the comic book voice. There was the inner voice of the reporter. Right. And there was the printed word that the reporter used, which always was a polished version of what the inner voice was. Mm-hmm. And, and I told him, look, you've ruined me for 
rest of my life. And that went right up until, well, now. So you're still really proud of that? Well, no, no, no. I, I'm, yeah, well, yes, I am. But also, I'm still trying to find a writer who will acquiesce to three panels on page. No, oh, interesting. Although Tom King has told me, you think it's very, it's a very interesting problem to solve. Because he wants nine panels on a page all the time. Well, he, at least with... Not with Lee. No, that's true. With with Lee Weeks? And Lee's the... Well, he's oh, well, that, that, top, top five guys working now, at that, least. That Elmer Fudd thing was beyond and, brilliant. And date night. That, that was the second annual. That was so good. Yeah. But but with, like, Miracle Man, with, uh, what's his name? Gerard's? Uh, the, 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 the guy that he works with a lot of times with uh, Babylon and, and, and different things with Mr. Miracle. Uh, I don't know. Oh, the king. Oh, it, he does a lot of uh, similar to nine panel grids in, in a lot of his work. King well, does. Sim would work with 12 panel grids, and it would be nothing but Cerebus's face and dialogue. Yeah, and Ben just kind of copies And you could this. read that in a second. It wasn't Watchmen. Right. Where it took an hour to read a page. Uh-huh. Just because it was back and forth, and there'd be a voice off camera, you know, and Cerberus didn't say that. You know, and, and then you're just off to the races. I mean, it was just... But he anyway. switched to other crazy things. God, he was so diverse in his... his right. In what he was doing. Right. When you were doing <laughs> Grendel, the momentum of that... What he was doing, at Wagner was doing. I thought that was like so exciting uh, from his own work to then the Panda Brothers. He was changing up every time. So when you had to do it, when he gave you that assignment, was there a lot of pressure to like I've got to make my my statement too because everybody was doing such bizarrely different things. Yeah, no, it wasn't because Matt was very constrictive on what he wanted. Ah. It was two stories in one issue, each issue. Uh, the vampire story and then the Orion story. And the Orion story was told like a newspaper. So the dialogue and the captions were kind of pasted in and stuff like that. And not no word balloons or anything like that. And a very strict grid. And then the idea was that the vampire stuff was whatever you want to do. And I wasn't ready for whatever you want to do. And I felt constricted by the other stuff, though. So it was it was weird. I was I was flattered. I was really good friends at this point with Matt, and it was ultimately important, but not that much fun. Ah, mm-hmm. uh, that's really interesting. And I have forever given him shit that I my Grendel is the only Grendel who never put on a Grendel mask. Yeah, right. So nobody ever asks for my Grendel. But you did get to do a Grendel mask eventually. You won an I Eisner did, for I, it. I, I did some uh, some uh, Hunter stuff. Yeah, Hunter Rose. You got an Eisner, right? The book got an Eisner. Right. I got an Eisner for Superman for All Seasons. Yes. Right. Which, that's true. Which, that's different. It's the only Eisner I've got. That's true. In mine. But you were part of the one that got... And I was part of... Long Halloween. That was black was and red, organizer. right? The, the, uh, black, white, and red. Yeah. Black, yeah. All right, so... And that was my first published uh, ink wash work. Speaking of not that much fun, let's uh, talk about Challengers of the Unknown. I, I've i read that, that Jeff Loeb was, was asking you more than what was in your wheelhouse at the time that he was, he was, he was pushing you. Well, it, I wasn't entirely fair with him. That, uh, I thought I could do stuff I couldn't do. Hmm. So there was that. It was more just how experimental the story was. It was all over the map. Right. It was crazy and for a DC book, especially. Yeah. Was and that was that the first Superman you drew in that Challengers yes. of the Unknown? And oh, that's good. Dick Giugiano said, "No, no, no." <laughs> I, I drew him more like a Fleischer. Dick said, "No, no, no." And he he took my art put a piece of tracing paper on it and drew, this is what it should look like. Oh, I see. So that's what I ended up drawing. Okay, okay. Not so the it, was, it was altered. It wasn't the Fleischer one that you yeah, intended. Yeah, he didn't alter it. Mm-hmm. But I had to alter it per his instructions. Well, instructions. you're in good company because you're with Jack Kirby in terms of DC making like changes to well, Superman. Well, 
<laughs> Starenko and Murray it's, Severin's face, you know. That's right. <laughs> Faces. Did you and Jeff Loeb essentially hit it off as far as storytelling? Did you think, okay, this is a writer, I want to do more projects? Oh, it with? took a while. He has intense charisma. Mm-hmm. I liked him right away, but I didn't know what to make of him. I see. He was very, he was one of those guys that was going bald and he had a long ponytail. This is the, you know, early 90s, right? And <laughs> I've seen guys like that in movies. I remember him saying to me at one point, why didn't anybody tell me I was an idiot? Oh, okay. I said, well, you know, we all thought it, but you know. <laughs> anyway, it, it uh, I went to his office at, he had an office at Universal mm-hmm. and he had a, Toy train. I see. On the floor. and So he was already kind of a TV movie guy oh, anyway. Oh, he's very into that. And, but he was really smart and really funny and really articulate and really into comics. And he said, look, I'm the guy, I'll just tell you right up front, I'm the guy that says, why can't we put a camera on the end of a broomstick and throw it through the window and see what that looks like? Hmm. And that was Challengers. So was that was his it, project? Did he want to do Challengers? No. Or who wanted to do no. Challengers? He, he, neither he or I had any history with Challengers at all. Right. He wanted to do Superman and Batman. Of course. Yeah, and yeah. Then, then, no. I see. You can't do that. So it was more what the company would let you guys and work And he with. said, eventually, after running down everything he wanted to do, he said, just tell us what's available. And they said Challengers? That was one of them. Uh, and he picked that one. What was the others? I have no idea. Uh, but before we go into the, the Jeff Loeb, Tim Sale, Tim Sale, Jeff Loeb world, Billy 99. That was published in 1991 and a bit, had a bit of a dark edge to it, a bit of a political twist. One of the, I think, catchphrases for that was, it's two o'clock, do you know where your rights are? Yeah. Uh, we spoke a little bit earlier. You said there was a bit of a Watchmen influence on it. In, Tell in us that, about no, that. In that catchphrase. As far as the catchphrase, okay. Not so much otherwise, it, but... But it was a time when people were telling vigilante stories, V for Vendetta, things like that. I mean, not political vigilante stories. Right, political vigilante, yes. I was very interested at that time in politically activated stories. Mm-hmm, okay. Some of that was because of V, which I think is a great piece of work. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, much more than Watchmen. And that was more Sarah, the writer. Sarah Byam is the writer. And I shared it all with her, but inevitably I was about the arc. Mm -hmm. And I had uh, just discovered a Batman Year One and Mesa Kelly. And therefore I I discovered the brush in a different way I'd known it before. Now I used a duo shade paper, I guess to have more control. It was going to be black and white. And... I wasn't ready to trust the ability to reproduce ink wash very well. Right. I'm still not. I'm still kind of iffy about it. My Batman black and white story is terrible because of the way it's reproduced. I think. Mm. Oh, I see the reproduction of it. Yeah. And I, and I remember looking at it and thinking, you know, fucking Warren could do this in 1965. Why can't you guys... Do it now. Reproduce it correctly. Yeah. Anyway, there was that. But, but yeah, so there's a lot of Mac- Mazzucchelli in Billy. In Billy 99. As far as the arc goes. And I, I lettered it, too. Oh, uh, okay. Which is the first thing I lettered since These World. Yeah. And that was the basis of, my lettering in that was the basis for Richard Starkings making a font of my lettering, which is now the only thing that is used Whenever I letter anything. Yeah. Or whenever I draw anything. And that was in what? That was in... Billy 99, yeah, he lettered But But you lettered... You were doing... They used lettering in your heroes, too, right? To some... They used... Your handwriting, at least. Richard Starkings of Comicraft, genius, he thinks, as do I, that the best lettering is by the artist, because it's part of the art. And he would ha- rather have it be, as is often the case, like uh, Giraud, often, uh, many other French, but also like Travis Cherist and things like that. It's pretty hard to read. So Richard has said, look, for a fee, we will make your own font. And you can always have your uh, stuff on computer that you can plug it in. And so that's how everything is lettered now. And Jeff goes so far as to insisting, well, when he was doing comics... 
uh, Richard is the only person who can letter my work. And it's not <coughs> obviously because he's a, he's an artist, but he feels that Richard, these are my words and Richard interprets my words, whoever's drawing it best. Mm -hmm. It's in his contract every time. Oh, it has to be wow. Richard. That's interesting. It's one of the great things about Jeff. That's great. <laughs> I had mentioned Heroes, the TV show. Yeah, uh, the opening credits, and I didn't know this, but if you if you go, and it's only like 50 bucks, anybody can buy my font from Comicraft. Mm. There's a uppercase, lowercase, and a brush, brush font. And the brush font is used for the credits in Heroes. And I didn't know they were going to do it. And Jeff said, look, watch, there's a surprise for you. That's great. <laughs> that is great. <laughs> Going back to Jeff Loeb, early 90s, he looks like that guy in those movies. Yeah. So then after Challengers... Uh, Shadow of the Bat. Oh, yeah. Does it work for hire? Work for hire stuff. Terrible. Yeah. I didn't like the stories at all. Oh, I see. Somewhere earlier, I'd met James Robinson at San Diego. I think he was up and coming, and Matt got to know him, and so he's part of the Matt crew. Uh-huh. And he was a, he was a guy who would periodically call and just chat on the phone. Same with Matt. Uh huh. And James drops that he sold a script for a Legends of the Dark Knight to Archie. Was that Blades? Yeah. And I said, "Do you have an artist?" No. Would you like to do it? Yes. And I told Jeff, and Jeff was like, "Fuck." How do I get one of those? I want to do that. Well, they don't repeat artists or writers, Jeff. Sorry. Hmm. But Jeff being Jeff, like, called Archie. Oh, okay. And wangled him into doing another one. Right. With the power of his charisma. It's pretty powerful. Oh, okay. That's cool. Okay. And I think also Archie liked what I did. Yeah, sure. You know, so there was that. Because uh -huh. it was awesome. I mean, Blades is, is and it's, you're, you're in the growth it's period. It's hard to tell. I love For me, it's hard to tell. It's so overwritten. Yes. So it's hard to tell. But your double pages, I mean, your, some of that stuff is really strong in a way that Challengers is like you're working through stuff. You've developed a lot between those periods. Mm -hmm. It's, it's a good, I mean, your draftsmanship, it? yeah. It's, it's, I haven't looked at it in a long time, but thank you. And they're just, Legends of Dark Knight at that moment is just hitting on all, because you do that and then, and Wagner does Faces, which just is great. And then you do the, I mean, like, it's just running like crazy at that point. And that's Goodwin, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. It has to be. Yeah. He's just nailing Well, and also, that. everybody wanted to do Batman, and that was the whole idea of, of legends, which is, and, and why it would have so much turnover is because so many people wanted to do Batman. Is it because of the movies, like the Michael Keaton movies were out? So no, it's more yeah, Batman? before that. Even before, okay. He's just fucking cool. People want He's a cool guy, yeah. I mean, they're getting to do without the yellow. I mean, it's, it's, it's letting people do yeah. like the one that they, they the think raw, is cool. The raw Batman, yeah. Yeah. The one that shoots people. And so Jeff said, how do I do it? And talked Archie into it. And, so we started to do this thing that was at least partially inspired, although I think the legend has become more than the reality. Partially inspired by the um, Denny O'Neill and Neil Adams Halloween in Rutland, Vermont yeah. issue. Hmm. And Jeff would say, well, it used to be DC would do a Batman Halloween thing every year. No, they didn't. They did pretty much that one. Huh. Marvel did a lot more of them than Rutland. Yeah. Yeah. And... At some point, it wasn't going to be. It was decided not to be a um, a legends thing. They were going to put them all in one issue. So that's why it's three issues long. The first Halloween special, right? That was when Jeff and I first started to learn how to work together. Oh, okay, that's cool. Because it, it was a long slog before, because it, it, he would sort of describe things to me, like on the phone, and, and I draw something, and I thought. Maybe I was more of a co-collaborator on, yeah. on the phone. On the phone, yeah. And he would always shoot it down and say no, whatever I came up with. So, like, uh, thoughts that you would originate on it, he would say no to those as far as a story. Okay. Or just a scene. So, he, the first Halloween special, 
it was when he first called, would call me and he had broken down the whole thing on a legal pad. You take a credit card, make a page out of that as a stencil, right? make it and just make notes and he'd describe it to me. And so we got to know each other. Remember that time in Casablanca when, you know, or that time Neil allowed to this and we really got to know each other. It'd be like five hours on the phone. Oh, cool. uh, and I'd, I'd be taking my own notes. And it was a lot less redrawing of stuff because of that. And I remember finishing it, and Jeff came up here, and we were going to do a store signing in Seattle. And I'm driving him to the store, and I said, you know, I don't think there was a single page that I didn't look forward to drawing in this story. I don't know if I'll ever have that again. He said, don't say that for crying out loud. <laughs> you know? Jeff, Jeff said that? Yeah. You're going to jinx it or something, you know. Because he felt like something was special was happening between you guys. He didn't say that, probably. But don't say maybe this will never happen again. Right. Don't. Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think this was because it was Batman? Does Batman speak to you? I mean, like, was that one of the reasons? Cause yeah, I it, do. Yeah, because it's so obvious that with Batman, you come alive in terms of that, in a way that you weren't engaged with challenges. And it's weird because um, and the I, I didn't really grow up with Batman. Right, but he's a cool character. I mean, I watched the TV show, and I loved the Adam stuff, but I didn't. I often didn't buy it Right, because I just bought Marvel. Uh-huh. I had to do that. Yeah, there was something visceral about it. Yeah, because you just instantly and take he, to those villains. the way he conceived of the character and Gordon, um, and that was also coming off of year one. I mean, Gordon was smoking in the, in right. the first thing, and uh, you know, so it. Well, anyway, and then madness, and then I think choice. There was fears, which became choices, or was choices, and then became fears. The second one is the Mad Hatter. The third one is the retelling of Christmas Carol. It's ghost. Yeah. You're, t- you're referring to the three one-shot stories. Yeah. Though. Yeah. It's the first time where I've seen you draw a horse, just to be really? like, my horse thing. Yeah. Well, you, I know you did other, like, earlier, like, dr- drawings. And you things. mean the scarecrow? The scarecrow horse. That's the one that's like... Those are pretty good drawings. Those are really good. <laughs> that's a good yes. horse. Yes, they are. I don't know how I pulled that out. And that's that was awesome. the Tim Sale horse that I, I, I picked and that I, I loved. But that was the first one I saw. I've since seen, like, in your book... That you, you you were drawing horses on postcards and everything else. You were you were interested in postcards yeah. and horses, but that's the horse where I was like, "Ooh, that's a horse." Yeah. That's well, a, horse. a lot of that was the Patrick Magoon too, the adaptation. Oh yeah. I just felt that I completely changed the character, the look of the character. Now, were you and, looking? And nobody's at the, ever mentioned it. Were you looking at the the comics too, like the Dan Spiegel stuff, or, or no. the? Only the the, the, the the actual film. The Mugun, yeah. Yeah. Because, yeah. yeah, you changed the character completely. Yeah. But you, you know, you don't, I don't know if they, they talk about it enough. You I changed the Joker completely, too. You, you, you cha- with the teeth, you changed they never, Poison Ivy they've completely. They've never said anything to me. It's just shocking. Yeah. Um, yeah, they, they have these kind of cool caricature type looks to them. I, I, I mean, they're, any, anyone who's seen them once, they'll remember those pictures. Those three characters, Scarecrow, Joker, and Poison <laughs> Ivy, I thought you just took it in a different direction. <laughs> well, Ivy was inspired by Black Orchid. Oh, yeah. The Game and, and McKean book. And I never thought I'd have to draw her again, much to my chagrin. Right. So I gave her all those leaves. And <laughs> That's a pain. <laughs> yeah, it is. So anyway, but that was the only thing. The Joker wasn't, if it was, if it was inspired by anybody, it was the Grinch. Oh, okay. That's interesting. Nah. And the Scarecrow was the Bachelor Magoon. Sure. Scarecrow and Romney Marsh. So now, um, before you did the, the long Halloween Batman <laughs> in 1996, you and Jeff Loeb went over to Marvel, worked on Wolverine Gambit victims in 1995. Were you guys essentially kind of on that growth curve of collaborative storytelling? Was it a different kind of process with that Marvel story versus the Batman stories? Tell me about that. And how did that get set up? Was that just Jeff Loeb kind of talking to someone at Marvel? Was that a money thing? Yeah, what was that? Yeah, Yeah, total money grab. That's what I thought. It was a money thing. Okay. But yeah, it was total money grab. I see. Okay. And Jeff said, look, these are the two. He'd been in the ex-office. 
and he knew they were the two top people in comics. Uh-huh. And I knew it as soon as I did it, and all of a sudden, teenage girls were, it was like the Beatles or something. Oh, I see. Draw me Gambit. Ha! <laughs> the only thing I found interesting about them was that they were two guys who thought of themselves as tragically spurned or been done wrong guys by a woman. Right. And they held that image of themselves with them. Oh, okay. That's interesting. And I said, let's explore what bullshit that is. <laughs> and it just got away from Jeff. He, and he admitted later he he just he didn't get around to it. He was fucking around with other stuff in the story. And that that's the biggest failure, in my view. To not explore that aspect. That we've that. ever had. No, it's a whole thing, except for the money. Now, I did make enough money that I rented a house on the beach in Malibu for a month in the which summer. Was, yes. Which was not cheap, based on Wolverine Gambit. Wow, that's cool. Because the revenue is based on percentage of sales at that point, wasn't it? I don't know. They yeah. paid us a lot of money. So there you go. Speaking of money, I, I wanted to ask you about image at this point, too. Cause yeah, I got less Death for Blow. that. You got less for Death Blow? But that was where everybody else was cashing in. Like that crazy. was the whole point of doing Death Blow. Let's, let's hear that. And it didn't work out that way. Why not? Well, first of all, I wasn't selling the way that other... I didn't sell that book the way that other people were selling books. But, well, but you actually could tell a story. I, I mean, not yeah. to be editorial, but well, like... Look at Image Comics in the 90s and you'll see how much importance they put on telling a story yeah it's actually hard to follow those stories i looked back at them yours is one of the only one that i i actually bought and could read and continue to read because right. it was you I obviously just, know how to tell the story awful i was hired to imitate uh jim lee imitating frank miller doing <laughs> sin city there you go uh, look the writing was awful the stories were terrible <laughs> Uh, I was always behind deadline when, you know, I I would get, oh, I'm so sorry, the script is so late, we need it tomorrow. That kind of stuff. And just terrible experience. (laughs) It would have been fine if there was was that cash cow. If you were getting it, like, because a lot of people, that was was their best experience in comics in terms of from a money perspective. They made money. At at Image. Yeah, at Image. And and you, and that was really I broke the mold. It was one of the only readable ones I ever I ever saw. It wasn't very good in terms no. of the story, but at least the panels made sense, made right, sense. Right. to me. I actually liked it in that context. Well, thank you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. I wish I'd enjoyed doing it. So, um, Batman Long Halloween, you know, that's probably a lot of that's a big fan favorite, I think, um, of a lot of the things you've done. The touch point. It's absolutely the thing that changed my life. Yeah. My career. And yet at the time, it was just another thing to do, a continuation of what we've been doing. Right. Right. And and Jeff knew it was ambitious in, on his end. From a writing Much more on, my, on his end than on my end. Okay. That he, when he was writing movies with his writing partner, his writing partner would make fun of him for his plot ideas. And it, to hear Jeff had to do murder mystery where if you guess it in the first three issues, you got ten more to go. <laughs> what kind of a drag is that? Right? Yeah, sure. So, um, and yet it all worked out. You know? Yeah. Was, um, I I learned a lot. I was worried that I'd be able to pencil and ink a book a month, which I still kind of can't believe I did. In fact, I, I asked Klaus Jansen to ink me. And he declined. Why? Um, I think because he didn't want to take it on. That's all. It's just a big okay. job for a year and stuff like that. Yeah, it's a dedication right there. Was he um, the guy you you were going to... I mean, was he your first... I, I talked with Archie and I said, I want, you know, I want something, somebody graphic. And I was looking around and I, I thought of Angelo Torres because of his work on Creepy and Eerie. Sure. But he hadn't done anything except sort of imitate Mort Drucker and Mad for a long time. And he's an old man. He, he turned it down. We talked about a few other people, but then it was Klaus. And I'm sure Klaus 
I'd love to work with Klaus. What Miller did in Daredevil is, I mean, that's a collaboration. Yeah. Anyway, Klaus's approach to ink is closer to mine than a lot of people. Because it's an Alex Toth kind of blackness and things. I mean, it totally. Well, it's sense. graphic. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it tactile, sort of, and, and that sort of way. Tactile. I like that word. Well, there's a lot of texture. Yeah, there is. No, I know what you mean. So, 1998, Superman for All Seasons. I think most comic people have read those four issues. They're pretty incredible. I love them. Uh, Jim, Jim, you've obviously read those. And I feel like it, they really capture who's, what Superman should look like, what he should feel like when you read him, the emotions that go revolve around Superman. Can you tell us a little bit about that collaboration with Jeff Loeb as well? Sure. Uh, well, I, I knew my, my personal pitch to DC was you have two of the three icons in comics. And we've done a lot of one of the two that you own. And I'd like a chance at doing second one. And it's going to be a, a difference between the dark and the light. Right. So my approach is going to be really different. Yes. But they didn't expect what I was giving them. Uh-huh. They made you change it to some degree, right? Some of the characters. Well, and some of that was absolutely reasonable when I look back on it. Um, I wanted Clark to look like a farm boy. I would wanted Superman to look like he didn't have to go to the gym to work out. And so the, the fact that he's eight feet tall, he's only mentioned once in the, in the book. But he's supposed to be this high school kid who grew up on a farm, Kansas. I wanted it to be clear that he was super as Clark, but not stand out in a certain sort of way. Right. And in a humble sort of way. And I also, you know, I, so I played with the humble and farm boy probably too much at first, and he ended up looking simple in the brain. Oh, okay, like of, uh, of Mice and Men, something like that? Yeah, something like that. Like he could break a rabbit's neck by accident? As the Hulk does in Hulk Gray. So, um, <laughs> nice. Full circle. Chirello came to my, I learned later, came to my defense in the DC offices because people were ready to fire me, I'm told. Why? Because they didn't want Clark Kent look like a dumb fuck. Okay, I see. Um, because of the simple approach. Okay. Yeah, it wasn't because of the, the thin lines or otherwise. And thank goodness. I think the, the real strength of the book is all in the first issue. I don't really care about the rest of the, the other three. No, personally. you're right. That's, that's the one that... Um, it's the most Rockwell. And I knew Rockwell was my touch point because I'd, um, you know, I grew up in the 60s and I, I kind of aligned him with, unfairly, with uh, right-wing politics. What, Rockwell? Yeah. Okay. I mean, there's a lot of flag, you know. Like Americana. Except that Americana is different than that. The attention to detail is a part of, pay attention to what's on the desk or what's in somebody's bedroom that tells a story about their character. And I just got so into it. And because I was doing pretty much only pen work, very little black, and the rest of it, I knew I wanted to be the co have the colors to take care of all that. It was just, it felt just right by the way. It was blue lined, which is something they don't do anymore because of computers, but it was actually painted. I don't know if I should explain blue line or not. Yes, sure. Yeah, please. Okay. Uh, it's a process leading to a way to color of printing the black and white artwork on a piece of uh, sheer acetate and then laying that acetate on top of a chemically treated piece of board and shining a light through that such that when you pick up the acetate, there's a blue, all the black is in blue, non-reproduction blue on the board. And so the, the uh, colors can paint right on that. And then you lay the, uh, the black, uh, the acetate with black line on top of that and photograph <coughs> that as your thing. But there's all kinds of problems with it, with registration and stuff like that. And it's now obsolete because of computers. Oh, I see. Um, and I think it was probably the last thing that was printed that way, certainly in this country. I'd seen it done in Europe, and I just thought it was a great way to do it. Anyway, I loved the, just the contrast 
between Batman and, and this, both in tone and in artistic style. And then I wanted Eisner for it, so DC shut up. And, there you go. Um, <laughs> That's how that goes. Who did the colors on that? Bjarna Hansen. And he was a friend of Teddy Christensen. Oh, so good. That Superman book he did was great. Yeah. It, isn't it? It is great. It is great. I've taught that before. That's a great Superman Well, which book. one? Oh, oh, the man for uh, the uh, the one that he did about doing the Superman project. Like like getting assigned Superman. You know what I'm talking about? No, it's, it's, not, it's a British plane, not that yeah, one? Yeah, that one. Okay, before that, he did a Superman book without permission. Oh, I know the one you're talking about, too. Is it, That's the one you're talking about? He, he's, the cover is he's open. Yeah. Yeah. That was my first introduction to Teddy. Oh, um, he's so good. But, yeah. But that, uh, the, the others. He's a really great, sweet man. Anyway, the... Um, so then coming back to Batman, I'd learned an awful lot by looking at Rockwell and other... It was my first really introduction and really looking hard at American illustrators outside of comics. Right. So that I think my work on Dark Victory is miles ahead of Long Halloween. Oh, yeah. Okay. It is, isn't it? Yeah. And that's in 1999, just to clarify for listeners. Yes. Yeah, I finished it, uh, or actually I was going over the color guides... In Pasadena, as I had just moved to Pasadena in 2000. So, I know that deadline. Yeah, Dark Victory. I was going to ask, what kind of, let's say, I don't want to say mistakes or things, but what had you learned from your previous storytelling to put Dark Victory together? But you added an aspect I didn't predict, which was you're actually looking at illustration outside of comics at the time. And so that was part of how Dark Victory turned out as far as those panels. Yeah, it wasn't about the storytelling so much as the just the inking quality. The actual pictures. My right? my ability to draw. Right. Was better. Wow. So like what kind of illustrators? So you saying Rockwell, what are some others that come to mind that you were looking at? Kobe Whitmore, um Frank McCarthy, Al Parker, Noel Sickles. Mm. Oh cool. Yeah. Yeah, Sickles could really illustrate these yeah, comics. I can give you half a dozen. Right, that's pretty cool. Now we're getting into the early 2000s. So you guys essentially did a lot of great work at DC. You had done that random Gambit Wolverine story. And then you guys kind of did a few things in a row over at Marvel, the color series. It was almost like Silver Age retellings of these characters. And you said you had read a lot of these comics from the 60s. How did that all come about? There were times when, especially in Spider-Man Blue, I think, yeah. that it was hard for Jeff because I wanted to specifically reference some of the Lee Ramita stories right after Ramita came on. So let's say issues 43 through, through 48. You did that other vulture, didn't you? The, 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 the young Blackie. One. I did Blackie. Yeah, yeah. Blackie I remember Drago. I remember that. Sorry. That was so Romita. I mean, and, and yeah. great Romita, but you, um, you were doing Romita there. The whole thing was my attempt to do Romita. And then I knew people were probably going to expect me to do Ditko. Uh, but my love of Spidey was Romita. And my love of Gwen was Romita. And it was really, the impetus was Gwen. I see. They were, and we, we've, Jeff and I have said this in print. They were about to come out with the first Kirsten Dunst, Tobey Maguire movie, where they took this blonde actress and gave her sort of red hair, not even really red hair, uh, and made her Mary Jane. And we were like, fuck, everybody's going to forget Gwen. And we would not have that. So we wanted to have Gwen and Peter be the, even though with the face of Tiger is going to yeah. be in there, right. we wanted to have... The two gals who were sort of fighting over Peter. Peter doesn't right. know what to do with it. It's yeah. the first time in his life. And poor um, Harry Osborne. And, just... and then Harry's a part of the story. Right. Um, Peter on a motorcycle. But you get, yeah, but you get, uh, you get to have all this flirtatious stuff and you also get to have some of the great villains, Craven, who I did not do very well. I regret. Really? Because no. I think he's a great visual. But the vulture. I would have loved to have done the shocker and yeah, we want to do the rhino. Jeff really wanted to do the rhino. I didn't want to do the rhino that much, but you know that kind of thing. So it was really an 
Jeff had to win his way through that because it wasn't he wasn't feeling it emotionally the same way. And yet he had a wow finish that knocks everybody out, especially boys. It's a it's a weepy love story for boys, really. Um, same way that Casablanca is. Oh, I see. Daredevil, for all its strengths, of which there are many, wasn't really much of a whole. We have uh, two issues of this origin story of Peter's relationship with his dad and the tragedy, the deaths and all that stuff. And then we wend our way through a romantic comedy through the rest of the book. Right. So it was really two things going on. And it was a lot of fun to draw. Mm -hmm. And each moment worked great. It just wasn't a, a whole. So that by the time we got to the Hulk Gray, that really worked as a whole. All takes place in 24 hours. Uh, Jeff's brilliant idea of why does Betty love the Hulk? It's because she only knows a monster, her father. Right. Um, and her sympathy for Bruce, but it's really her attraction to the Hulk. Yes. That was the mystery. And then Jeff explains it. And it, uh, he also takes her through the seven stages of grief, all within 24 hours. And I got to draw the goddamn Hulk. <laughs> the or or the inedible bulk as I right right based him on although goddamn Hulk sounds pretty cool too um the desert yeah it was so much fun the I New Mexico a lot desert. of uh, uh, European work so uh, um, Giro and Book uh, who does Bouncer yeah oh, yeah sure. um, absolutely. So a lot of that stuff. What about Kirby? Because you haven't said because the other two. He wasn't a big influence on. Because I didn't see it there, and no. that's interesting. But it's like, but how could it not be? I mean, the Gray Hulk. Once you say Gray Hulk, it's like you think that, but that's not what right. I saw in it, and no. that's interesting. No, to me. much more Marie. Oh, okay, um, Marie Severance Hulk. Yeah, Marie, that makes Marie sense. Marie and an ape combined. That was the and actually trivia or soon to be. Reality. Uh, Jeff and I are doing a one-page story of the inedible, inedible bulk in some Marvel something 1000, just like Detective 1000. Oh, cool. And it's a barely a reimagining of, a, of three panels in an inedible bulk story where he's walking down the street. And uh, in, the, in the Severn story, a cannon shoots him right in the back, and it just blows up and he, he's licking a popsicle that he's just gotten and he says mmm bulk like this avocado lime bar <laughs> and and then we pull around to see his face and he's just somebody you know somebody say something or something like that somebody bulk felt a gnat in the you know a, that kind of thing and so we're going to do it something like that yeah hey, that's pretty cool um, <laughs> and it was between that and Dr. Doom which is the one that was the one that got away from me uh, that I wanted to do with Jeff that we never got around to at Marvel. Um, I'd love to do it because I love the origin story with Boris. Right. It's at the end of one of the annuals. I can't remember which one. Oh, yeah. It's only a five page story or something. But Oh, it, it, one of the Fantastic Four like, annual. It begin, like, yeah, it begins five, with him six, on the throne. Yeah, and so, so good. He calls for Boris and. That opening splash page. Oh, yeah. yeah it's so good. Yeah. Which, uh, you know, and I, I got lots of questions, but uh, <coughs> I'm quite going on that because I know people that you, that you, um, most admire amongst the, the, the artists that influences. And you don't mention Wally Wood in both in terms of Daredevil and now that Dr. Doom. Cause I think of Dr. Doom, obviously Kirby, but those, those amazing adventures. Uh, Doctor Doom stories are so good too. Is Wood not somebody that is in your? Not for superheroes. Ah, uh, not even with Thunder Agents. And, so what? What is interesting to you with Wood? If if not superhero, because they're Spirit, the Spirit on the Moon. Ah, I like, kind of like him better as an inker than a penciler. I never right. liked the the uh, you know soft porn stuff. I never the Sally Forth. There's some of the. Uh, 
What about his EC stuff? Because you yeah, really like some of some of the some of the EC stuff, absolutely. So Spirit on the Moon, that's when what Jules Pfeiffer wrote it, and yeah. he, he ghosted for Will Eisner, and yeah, and the Spirit Detective went to the moon. Okay, because I know you like air airplane stuff, and Wally Wood, I mean, Alex Toast does the best, but Wally Wood does some killer air fights. Where in um both in terms of. Some of the EC stuff he does a few, but in in the Warren stuff he does a couple of really good air fight battles. Too. I don't remember those. Um, but I was going to say uh, Sky Masters. Yeah, yeah. So oh. him inking oh, yeah, Kirby, he's Kirby, a great Kirby. And those are and, those are nice. And Kirby's work is great in those. Yeah, uh, and Wood takes it over as he does, right? Which is on the inking fine in, at, at times. Um, I mean, I always feel that way about certain anchors like Kevin Nolan, who takes over. But he, yeah, but he made it better. But I he mean, took you know, over. Just, yeah, he took over that um, Spectre story with even Ditko. And I don't like anybody st- like taking over Ditko completely. It looks like a Nolan story, but it's so good. I don't know that. Oh yeah, he did. Yeah. He did a very. Sh- it was a short, and it was a Spectre story. And and he ain't Ditko, and it's it's awesome. I'll well, send I'll send it to. Well, you. there's that. Um, what was it? Kelly Puckett, um, Batman and Superman story. It's pretty well known, and it's amazing. And it's Robin is fascinated with Superman and wants to be introduced to him. So Batman introduces him, and Robin is just ah oh, man, it's so cool. Look at him, he's so great. Right. And Batman says he's thunder. He's a lightning. He's an alien. Hmm. Do not trust him. And there was a time when Kelly Puckett was really writing just the way that Darwin or uh, Bruce Tim could write, right to the core, yeah. very simply, a character. And a lot of his Batman Adventure stuff was just perfectly right on, spot on. But that Nolan story was great. I, I think he inked um, Casada terrifically on Sword of Azrael. I was told Joe didn't like it because he took it over, but, you know, just beautiful, beautiful work. Hmm. And he's a really sweet guy. Right. He's so good. I mean, he's he's great. There's so many of those guys that are just like people don't understand how good they are. Well, he doesn't work very much. And, you know, lives in the middle of Kansas and... In 2005, your artwork was in Hero Season 1. You guys had talked about that a little bit earlier. Um, So how'd that gig come about exactly to do that? I get a call from Jeff who says there's a guy named Tim Kring that has had a successful show called on NBC for like 10 years, and it's coming to an end. And so he, the next thing he wants to do is the story, and he's written a script for it, and I've guided him through the script a little bit. And it's kind of a superhero story, but he wants to make sure that when he sends the script to NBC executives, that he can do all he can for it. So he wants some illustrations to go with the script. So he puts me in touch with Kring, and I talk to Kring, and we talk through some stuff. And that's where the atom bomb yeah. vision comes from. Right. And so I did that. And the next thing I know, I get a phone call from Kring's office saying he'd like to see me in his office at Universal. Oh, cool. And I show up and there's a producer and a director and a couple of other writers and Kring there. And they'd already sold the pilot or they were going about to make the pilot. Right. And they were at a point where they had decided that artwork should be a part of telling the story. Sure. Makes sense. And so they wanted to know my painting ability. And I said, well, I'm colorblind. I can't paint. But you have a computer on your desk. Let me show you uh, what we do in comics. For, when I do ink wash, it's colored in, on the computer. And it looks like painting. And so I did. And I was hired. And um, I show up at a location shoot somewhere outside of uh, San Bernardino. Um, and I get there just in time for lunch. <laughs> and we meet in this trailer. And uh, I met the prop master, who was going to be my liaison. And it turns out she lives like a mile from where I was living. So she was my go-between for all the stuff, all the things people remember. 
at that meeting, there are like 20 people at the table. The director's there. He's trying to bounce some stuff off of me. He's thinking visually, blah, blah, blah. It sounded kind of Hollywood to me. Oh, okay. It was Hollywood. Uh huh. But the person I was going to be working with was the prop master. And her name is Gay Perello. And she had worked for a long time on the previous show that uh, Kring had done, Crossing, not the last, Crossing Jordan, something like that. And they were reluctant to film something and then just give me a screen capture, which I repeatedly said to them, it's going to save you a lot of time if you just do that. If you're going to ask me to draw something and then when you go to film it, it's not what you want, I'm going to have to redraw it. It's not like moving a camera 10 inches to the right and you can just make it happen. I have to redraw this. Movie. Yeah, that's right. And uh, that was something Jeff had to learn. Can you just, you know, shift it to the... <laughs> you mean redraw it? Yeah, right, I redraw the, I could. the entire thing, <laughs> yeah. Um, and Jeff actually used that line in the writer's room to directors when we were talking about things. So he repeated me to back then. That's funny. Anyway. Um, so... It took a little bit of time, but it happened during the uh, the pilot where they the show figured it out. Film it first, give me screen capture. That was the most obvious one. But the first thing that was the first scene with the art is in the artist studio, and he's destroying all these pictures. They make multiple copies of all the pictures, just to make sure they had enough for all the takes they had to do. So a lot of people ended up with props that they could take home. Um, and the first one was an exploding bus uh, that was on the Gaza Strip that Gay had to spend money to buy from uh, from a, a photo house, which she didn't want to have to do. And the, but the second one was the train wreck, and it was uh, and she had a uh, in house guy that was part of the prop department cover color the the bus. And, uh, you know, I didn't like it, but it was okay. And then she showed me, she came, actually came, I was at a, a convention in L.A., and she showed up and showed me what he had done with the train wreck. And I said, well, that is just not going to work at all. Um, and she said, yeah, I wanted to show it to you, and I was hoping you would say that. And I said, well, I got a guy, and that was Dave Stewart. Oh, okay. And then he was the only other guy that they used ever I have a copy of the train wreck on my, oh, cool. in my house but it's like it's one of those things that what the fuck am I going to do with this I mean it's very impressive but it's six feet by three feet and it's a train wreck for crap <laughs> on fire you know so yeah it was, takes a lot of space uh, plus who wants to look at that <laughs> right except me I'll take it um, yeah that was my first experience with heroes and the and the first Season was nothing but fun. It yeah. Surprised everybody working on the show, how it took off. Yeah. There would be group emails uh, from the studio or from the people dealing with the studio about how the ratings were through the roof and right. going up and up and up. It was a good first season. It was. And then a disastrous finale. Yep. Like anticlimactic. And then written by Kring, writer's strike. And they hadn't figured out what they'd done wrong at the end of the first season. But I had art in every season. It was just rock paintings or oh, okay. graffiti. Right, right. And I didn't make very much money on it. I, I was paid a salary. They say they didn't know. And they didn't know. But that's why you get an agent. And I had an agent. That the artwork would drive the show. Because it had never happened before. And the idea was that I would be getting a salary, whether or not they wanted any art that week or not. But not only did they want art every week, they wanted multiple things. There was no scale that, you know, okay, well, if you have to do more than one piece, you get X amount of money in earth. And then my agent at the time sold every piece from the pilot right away. That's crazy. And I said, what are you doing? And he said, and he'd already done it. And I said, oh, Tim, I've been involved with these things for a long time. It never really adds up to anything. It took off like crazy. So he, 
This is Mitch Itkowitz. So he probably cost me hundred, hundred fifty thousand dollars. Okay, that's frustrating. Because in that first season, that that those pieces would. It was the only season where there was any money. Yeah, to be made. but that was it. That was it. You yeah. were going to make money off of that without question. Right. So I didn't. All right, Superman Confidential. Yeah. Where you're working with Darwin. How weird was it or good was it to work with another artist as a writer? And I know you were an admirer of his. Was that a fun project to do together? Well, first of all, Jeff had left for Marvel. I was still under contract with DC. Right. So I was bereft. Dan DiDio had the idea of a series of confidential books, first of which would be Superman. Pairing me with Darwin was a dream come true. Right. But I still had never worked with Darwin. Well, I did date night with him. Right. But he wrote, like, page one, this is what happens. You know, three lines. And so I was, I fleshed out that a lot. Because that's all he had. He was going to do it himself. He was just on his shelf. So he'd never written much more than that. So I took it from that. And it was a joy, obviously. And problems were... Darwin didn't really have a story. And I think he thought... This is for the confidential. I think he thought he was going to figure out as he was going. And he really never did. And he also wasn't communicating with Chiarello, who was the editor, and me about where we were going. And I had to do the covers before a lot of the stuff was printed, sort of first, right, all at once. And there is a kryptonite rock, a rock of kryptonite, in which a being is inside of it. And we don't know if that being is innocent, evil, whatever, and couldn't get Darwin to say so. So right. I drew covers where they were fighting, and it turns out he's he's supposed to be beneficial to mankind. So it was totally out of whack. I was drawing half of it without knowing any idea where we were going. But in between those things, there were moments of... Just Darwinian, Lobian vignettes that were just so perfect. Yeah. And we begin with a date night on the Eiffel Tower. But anyway, there's a scene with a polar bear at the Fortress of Solitude that Darwin in print said, I wrote my first Tim Sale scene. So he knew what that was. Right. He just didn't do very many of them. And that was frustrating. But everybody Um, had to, I mean, Jeff Loeb had to learn how to do that, right? I mean, like it's... Yeah, but Darwin knew how to do it. He knew exactly what it was. Jeff showed him what it was. And Darwin knew what to do. He wanted he also wanted to tell this other story that he hadn't figured out yet. And if he figured it out, I'm sure it would have been a much more satisfying experience. But I slowed way down because I was just, you know, what the hell are you doing? And I want to be inspired. He wouldn't talk with me. I couldn't get him on the phone. There was no back and forth. I was used to that with Jeff. But there were things like the polar bear, the date in the Eiffel Tower, all the stuff when we went back to Kansas. Superman swallowing a lava. He didn't know if he would be okay. (laughs) <laughs> on the inside. Right. He's terrified. He shows up at his parents' house going, ah, I, Like, what's going to happen? No, I just went through this horrible experience. Right. And one of my favorite panels I've ever drawn, one of my favorite scenes I've ever drawn, is he vomits lava on his hands and knees on the beach of this <laughs> atoll, right, that he's saved. And there's the dog singed and smoking, barking at him. 
while he's doing this. <laughs> no explanation, no anything about it. Final question on, on Confidential was, it seems like you could do Batman for, like, ever and just do new things about it. Was part of the, the Confidential thing that, like, you just nailed it with Man for All Seasons? Do you think you have as many Superman representations as you do Batman? Not Superman, but Superman's world. Especially as it pertains to Kansas. I think there's a lot of stories that could be told there. Sort of him going home, but also early stories. You know, Lana and Pete, Ma and Pa. I tried to imply some of that with the uh, my faux photograph Polaroids that I did in the beginning of the collection. So there's a swimming hole. There's a there's baby Clark with Rusty, the dog that never really lived. You know that story? Yeah. 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 And, you know, stuff like that. But that's not... He doesn't have a rose gallery that interests me. You know, he doesn't have that kind of thing. It's it's really the Kansas stuff that interests me. Oh, interesting. So when you saw Superman, the film... Because Lois really interests me. The, the, I, I'm so on board with that. When you saw Superman, the movie... Which one? 78. 78 with Christopher Reeve. Yeah. For me, that's... Glenn Ford and that particular aspect is the one that, like catches me emotionally when Pa Kent dies, everything about it, the angst of being able to do everything but not show off about it. Like right. I love that stuff. And and like that's probably the part that, that catches me the most. And you got that so well in A Man for All Seasons. So that's Rockwell. A lot of that is Rockwell. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. So that is your Superman, isn't it? To yeah. some degree. I didn't draw it to that. I drew it to Rockwell. Right. They well, did too. Jeff was they? more of a, yeah, probably. Jeff was more of a fan of that movie than I was. You know, the first thing I think of is I like Pink Fair much less, you know, so it's not. Huh. There's, a, there's a lot that's really dated and a lot that works in Kansas, but I think we did Kansas better than the movie did. I think Darwin did. Kansas better than the movie did. Darwin does everything better. I mean, like, I know you don't care for Wonder Woman. Darwin nails Wonder Woman in New Frontier. Like, he makes it more interesting than anybody ever did, I ever saw. I agree. I own... I own that page. Ha! Seriously? Yeah. And he hand-lettered it for me. There's the door of space, man. That's it. You, you own that page. That's great. Wow. Clark, come in. You know, join us. No one ever got one oh, woman is better than Kyle. Come in. No, and from that to the niggers over here, you know, just the range of that, the scope of that story. I rarely go to the comic book store. But I had gone to the comic book store and I saw the New Frontier and I looked at it and I was flipping through and I saw, you know, full page spreads and three panels on a page and it just looked great. I loved the drawing and took it home, read it. I remember reading it at the gym of all places and I remember reading the, the two pages were Martian Manhunter is changing shape as he's watching TV. (laughs) Showing it to my girlfriend at the time who was, you know, in in the gym with me. Hey, look at this. This is great. She's like, what are you talking about? And we talked about it earlier. I wrote a fan letter. And that was just, you know, saying uh, to Darwin and to Dave and to Chirello, what a perfect story. And how much I admired it. But I didn't know any of the DCU. So I was learning all these people. Darwin was a huge military guy. Challengers, though. You knew challengers. 
No, I didn't know Challengers. We we made up Challengers. I I had we had no Jeff and I had no history with Challengers. We so never, when you saw Ace Morgan as that character, you must have said, "Holy shit!" Jeff that's... said to me, "As far as I know, these are four guys who look exactly alike, except with different hair. We're going to make them as different wizards as we can." No, I so I didn't know the Challengers, but I didn't know the losers either. And and the ah, oh. you know, the first issue begins, and like. 15 pages in, they all die. And they're like, what the hell is going on here? Because they're losers. Well, I guess, but, you know, <laughs> jumping into the fucking dinosaur's mouth. And how great is that? You know, I, anyway, it, I had no idea where I was, but I loved it. And that's a very rare thing for me in comics. The only other time I felt like I've discovered something that the world already really knew was Black Sad. I was going to ask you about that, because that knocks me out, too. I saw the first issue, first volume, in Paris, in a store, and I looked through it, and, oh, my God, this is great. And I went and saw my friends and said, do you guys know this? And they said, yeah, it's the number one book in Paris. And I said, oh, okay, well, you know. Is that the first issue I, or the polar bear issue? No, the first issue with the cigarette. Yeah, okay. Polar bear issues, I was going to say better. It's not better. It's more ambitious. It's, yes. The first that, one is strictly private eye. That polar bear is artistically designed as, like, evil in a way that, like, God, it's amazing. Yeah. I own two color sketches that Wanho did just working out color stuff, which he does a lot before he gets to the page. One is the hanging of the bird that we see on page two. Yep. And the other is the uh, the three horses that call out Black Sad for being half black, half white because of the... What happened to your snout? He says to him. Black Sod is brilliant. Mm. It's all anthropomorphic. Uh, he's a house cat, private eye. Jim was talking about the polar bear. The second volume is all about racism. First one is just straight ahead, private eye, Sam Spade stuff. Right. And they all have... They haven't been... The first two haven't been topped. There are three more. I mean, like, at some point you just say, you're not going to do better. Right. And that's common with, like, so many comics. It's like, that's where you hit it. It's it's like... But the level of artistry is always superb. When you got an Eisner, which you did get one, and it, it also has to do with the, the notion of Eisner, because when you list all of your favorite artists that are most influential, you didn't mention Eisner. Right. What was it like to get an Eisner and what it was, what is your relationship with Will Eisner in terms of as an artist? Getting the Eisner was twofold. One was I was very nervous and did not think Jeff. And he said to me, if you ever win another award and you don't thank me, I will never forgive you. (laughs) Did he mean it? I think he did. I admire Eisner more than I like his work. As a groundbreaker, as a interested artist trying to tell different stories different ways, and the variety of stories that he wanted to tell is vast, and did tell is vast, but I never was really drawn. Some of the splashes, sure, but... I never was really drawn to the stories or maybe there's a, a, a kind of archness to the or datedness to the dialogue and the situations and things like that. I just, he never made an impression on me the way that I guess his minions did. <laughs> Does that include Darwin? Did you ever talk to, to Cook about that? No. I know. He obviously had a great investment. No, because I don't think that's Darwin's best work also. Darwin was too in love with 
Eisner to make it his own. What is Darwin's best work? New Frontier and Solo. Ah. How do you feel about Parker? Unreadable. Oh, that is really interesting to me. Why? It's too nihilistic. Uh, because of the source material. Yeah. Yeah. Darwin's part is spectacular, but he was so in love with Westlake. Right. And his relation with Westlake, his personal relationship, he revered him. So it leaves me cold. But you think I, mean, he, I have it all because I, I love the graphics of it. But but he successfully captures it, and that's what the problem is, right? I mean, he like yeah. And I have no interest in reading Westlake. Right, I that, see. Boy, I think the visuals, like they, it's some of they're his, great. They're so it's some of his best work. But I understand what you're saying, and it's his best work in a way that is not what you want to see him do. It's cold-blooded. The art reflects that. There are some really interesting storytelling techniques that he'll do. I can think of a number of pages where he'll encapsulate, I'm sure, our 20 pages into this sort of montage. And then he'll go into panels. And he'll know just when to do that. On the other hand, he'll have a, you know, a page like, Parker's drinking a bottle of whiskey. We see a window. We see a bottle of whiskey fly out of the window, smash against the wall and across the alley. And then we'll go back to just the window. And that's it. Yep. And just great storytelling. You can only do that when you're writing it yourself or adapting it yourself. Or you're working with a writer who says, this is what we need here. And that's rare. It's really rare. Is there something that you would have liked to have adapted? Because I know you're interested in film. You have a good knowledge of film. I think of Simonson doing Alien, and it's like, man, he nailed that so well. Mm -hmm. Is there anything you would have liked to have done as a adaptation, either film or literary, that you just are dying to do that you haven't gotten to do? Nothing comes to mind. What about Caged Heat on Cinemax? No, I'm kidding. That'd be interesting, though. I'd read your take on that. I mean, you have so many, like, there are such sensibilities with you and things that are obviously you. Like, with Man for All Seasons, you've got it with, like, like with that notion. Is there anything that, that just a movie that just or or a piece of literature that you'd like? I can do that. Well, you mentioned Conan before. I don't know what I could bring that Frazetta and Kubrick didn't. Bring. I see what you're saying. Following Potter's model for black and white vignette drawings, twenty or thirty of them throughout a small book, and then maybe four color full page things there's no money in any of that there's no it's too much work to try to get it off the ground the sports writer for like saturday evening post and things like that who wrote a book called the snow goose which has been adapted by the bbc in the 70s harris and jenny agatur a heartthrob in the 70s hmm. and it's about a young girl Growing up in the on the South Marsh coast of England and coming of age through a, a number of years, and she meets the kind of legendary ogreish person who lives not in the marsh, but in the marshlands, uh, you know, in a house and stuff. But if not a hunchback, he's he's crippled in one arm or something like that. And he's an artist, and he paints the geese. And he teaches her. She comes to him with an injured goose and says, I, I'm told that you know how to heal. And they try, and he says the way that we'll know if she's okay is if she comes back next year. So that it takes place over a long period of time. And so as they grow older, 
and she becomes 15, 16, 17, they begin a kind of relationship, and then Normandy happens, because that's where it is. It's where it's set. And she comes to see him, and he's getting in a, sh- a boat, and says, I have, to, I have to go. I have to go save some people. And she begs him not to go. And it's just a heartbreaking story. I mean, he doesn't go back. and But the goose does, right? And just, it's like a 90-page noveletta, right? And I've always wanted to illustrate it. I did some sketching of it when I was in New York in 1976. Very influenced by Potter. But outside of that, I, I haven't, uh, no, I haven't ventured beyond comics or if somebody well, paid me to do it, I would do that tomorrow. Let's talk about Tim Sale Black and White. Richard Starkings believed there was a way to make money by championing various artists. He, he had done this with uh, Jeff Scott Campbell, which was much more just an art book and but for me, the background was a, uh, and the backbone was a interview where he would drive up from LAX and drive to Pasadena and spend six hours talking and taping an interview with me, birth to earth, as they say in uh, Versailles Story, and just went out and gathered like a gazillion images of mine and populated this big, beautiful book. What was the last version that was published? Heroes in the Backyard. There are only, there are only two. One was the, the sort of smaller uh, 9 by 12 I guess, version. And then there was a bigger... Hardcover. Hardcover with a color cover and had like 300 or more pages in it and had... A, a color section had, and its subtitle was Drawing Heroes in the Backyard, which, you know, meant that I was working on heroes and I worked in my studio, which was in my backyard. But there was no more uh, interview than the, in the previous one, but a lot more art. And would, would you like to do a, a, a revised version? I don't think it needs it yet. I mean, I would like to hope that there's a point where it might make sense. But there isn't, there isn't that sense now. That's a good, good answer. Yeah. That was a real joy to put together. I mean, uh, I love Richard. He's smart. He asks great questions, interested. It was easy to edit with and go through all that. And so, no, it was great. It's a super smart interview with you. It's something I agree. To, yes. I, I, it, it's something for us to aspire to. I mean, like, uh, all the questions asked are very smart. I respect that book a lot. There was a lot of editing because we were chatting a good deal of the time, right? Just in my living room and talking and drinking beer. And, and that's the difference. We were drinking gin and that was beer, so maybe it's... No, I don't think that's the difference. Uh, the um, <laughs> just trying it. Yes, casual. I mean, the dogs are lying around. Well, we got our version of that. Pete Coogan. <laughs> <laughs> Joss Whedon. Did you yeah. ever have a conversation with him? Yeah, more than one. I just want to say because Tim did a Tales of the Slayer, and it was a very good one. As a Buffy fan, I, I want to ask him about this because I want to know about your experience with Whedon. Well, I was a Buffy fan. So, like, you're a Buffy, the, the, the TV show fan. Yes, yeah. there, there is no other. Joss is a odd duck. So, it's hard to have a conversation with him. Mm. without thinking that he's working on a lot of different levels. Oh, okay. This is super interesting. I, mean, like, I don't know if you're like a big fan, but Joss is a odd duck. Yeah. Let's talk about this. Um, I wanted, right away, 
to connect with him because I was a fan. Jeff knew nothing about Buffy, for, and then he faked it. He asked Richard for the entire box set of Buffy DVDs, like the day before he had to go to audition for a job on Buffy. And so he, like, bulleted through all those episodes. And I said, we could just ask Richard or me, but anyway. But I met Joss first on, not on, maybe on set. I remember showing up on set and showing Jeff a two-page spread from Dinner of a Yellow Number 2, the uh, subway scene with Daredevil and the train is rocketing past him, but on another track because he's killed or the fixers died. Right. Anyway, I showed up to show Jeff and I showed that to Willow, actually. And she was very sweet and said, oh, that's so great. But whatever. But every conversation I ever had with Joss was uncomfortable in some way. <laughs> yeah, it was just, it was weird. Including working on Tales of Slayer. It, that, what do you want to do? You know, well, I don't want to do this. Let's do something medieval. Okay. He just wrote something. And Was he smart about it? I mean, was it like, what was weird? Smart how? Well, that's what I'm asking. Like you said, it was weird, but like he seems. Is it because his mind was in other places? So he didn't feel like he was listening to the conversation at the moment? I don't know if I know that. I see. So uh, maybe what was going on in his mind, it didn't feel like he was quite with you in the conversation. I mean, from your perception. There was always a sense of disconnect. Disconnect of the moment. I also remember a time when I had a drink with him at the Marriott in San Diego, very quiet. Somehow, Kirk Douglas' movie, The Bad and the Beautiful, oh yeah, came up. And I talked about how I loved it. Yeah. And there was a real moment of connecting that could have happened because he said... I love that movie. <laughs> and then it went nowhere. <laughs> right, because he wasn't connected to the conversation, it sounds like. So, but he oh. gets movies. He is a natural in terms of musicals. I Like, whatever he does, whether it's that Glee episode, or it's his, obviously once more with feeling, he really knows how to do a musical in a way that so many people don't. What you're saying is he can't relate it in a conversation. He couldn't with me. I don't know if he could with somebody else. Right, right. That's interesting. He's just awkward socially. There you go. That's the bottom line there, it sounds like. But talented in, in what he does. Yeah. Right. And, and you know, like, gee, that's weird to be like that sensibility and be in, in the field that we're all interested in. I mean, half the people deal with it are socially. Right. It makes perfect sense. But yeah. nonetheless. Did animation influence you at all? And did manga? Because it almost looks like it would, except I don't think it does necessarily. But no. but manga especially, it's like you, you have those... Things in a in a bit, but I don't think it is actually there. I think no. it's it would be a misunderstanding. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but you understand why I'm saying it, right? Not really sure. Okay. All right. And fair enough. All right. You have mentioned multiple times Mark Chiricello. Chirillo. Chirillo. I think he's beyond awesome. Me too. How do you feel about DC firing him? How do you feel about his work in general and his impact on your career? I think it's an idiot move. Beyond it, yeah. On DC's part. Furious. Especially as it, as I understand it, it's a money move. And it just shows the ignorance of the people who are making these decisions, which are, um, if they're based on money, it's short-sighted because there is nobody that has a greater 
standing in the artistic community to get talented people to come to your company in Chiarella and to be a, a soft landing for talent to come in, including me, absolutely. So I selfishly mourn it, but I also think it's fucking stupid on as a corporate point of view. Now, I understand that from speaking to Mark, he's doing fine, but it still pisses me off. Between him and Karen Berger, it seems like some of the firings are like the dumbest things I can even imagine being yeah. in terms of DC. Those would be the two that I, I, it's like, what in the world are you doing? My history with Karen is not great. So I come down on the side of Chiarello if, if we're going to pair the two. Right. right. But you would understand why yeah. a general person might sure. say that. What's your relationship? Karen would look at me and then walk right past until I made money for the company. And then she was my best friend. Yeah, I see. Ah, I haven't heard a lot of negative criticism about her. She was anything English, automatically better. English, you mean as in British? Yes. Almost fetish, I would say. Anglophiles. But, boy, they were hitting it, like, hard, too. I mean, you can't... Yeah, but she wasn't trying to find anything else. She was in thrall of anything that came from the aisles. Right. That makes sense. And I think that because of how she treated me. Because you could have been, you're perfect for that. I didn't aspire to that. There was no money in that, really. It's how you get on Entertainment Weekly, I guess. But you don't make any money. And I'm was interested in making money with Jeff and doing other stuff that I really enjoy doing. Doesn't mean I wouldn't have enjoyed doing some stuff for Vertigo if, you know, Karen had a thought of putting me together with somebody or asked somebody who they might want to work with and they came up with me or, you know, there are all kinds of ways that it could have worked, but it didn't. But her walking right past me until she was interested that I was making money for the company is a deal breaker. And she did have a better sense of, in terms of the writing, I mean, the thing on Vertigo during a certain period of time was the writing was better than the art. Yeah. I'll never forget her praising Alan Moore's hysterically overwritten prose at the beginning of Trump thing. <laughs> like real literature somehow. Like right. raindrops splashing on the... It was just hysterically written. <laughs> I, I, I have to think intentionally. And she took it literally. Right. Like it's perfect. Like that's literature. And you know... Yeah, you okay. <laughs> Although I lost my interest and my respect. Yeah, that's interesting. You know what he I'm was, talking about. He was no, a, I know because I've met people very like that. beginning. But I know that issue too because yeah, well that that and that's how he started it off, right? Yeah, and then it ends it's with the swamp, swamp getting shot and all that. Yeah, it's. A, I mean, I, I like that sequence, but you're right. That first issue is just it was just paragraphs of words. It's pulp. Prose. Right. Everything is overwritten. That's not writing. But it's not it's not like Shakespeare literature and stuff. Yeah, well don't, Shakespeare don't, is that too. And, and uh, Shakespeare was blowing. Don't say it's brilliant. Right, right. I see what you're saying. And because I've also met people like that in environments where like that person wouldn't really, would be dismissive unless you prove something and then they were suddenly so nice. And, and so I understand that too, because I have but, run into that. But Burger knew Basically, not. It's hard to say this and not sound. It's not literal, but she knew who to who to blow at the right time. I mean, like in that this was the right. Like he was catching fire. She knew to praise him at the moment, whether it was overblown, whether it was whatever. 
But he just, well, he was Gavin, of the moment. Gavin was her real guy that she blew at the right time. Right. Right. Blown to the point of overblown, you're saying. No, I don't, I'm not saying overblown because it worked. Right, I see like, what you're saying. Like, I, I won't say overblown. I mean, she's also running a line of comics, she, too, so she has kind of working that. I get what you're saying. She killed it. No, I mean, I, I like, in terms of as an editor, whether right. it was right or not, whether she made mistakes. Right. But she did move that line right. at that time in a way no, that I know. And, and from off. that from that management angle, I see totally what you're saying. And I think just from what Monsignor Sale is saying is that just from <laughs> just from his own personal, like, you know, interaction. From a writing that, perspective. From that, and I like that. I like knowing the good and also the negatives. I like hearing that. Well, but I also, um, I agree with your point, but she didn't also then... Encourage and seek out other voices in a way a good editor does. Yes, right. there's some. She um, she stuck to the English kids, and she probably knew that was kind of like this niche she was kind of hitting at the time. But it wasn't that kind of like the, the '90s. There were some elements of just if you hit that one niche and get kind of extreme with it. Wasn't that kind of a theme of the '90s anyway? So Image kind of did their version of that, and it sounds like she kind of went extremely British, right? I don't know what pressure she was under. I'm sure it was a lot. When she found something that worked, I can imagine that she just wanted to relax and say, I found something. Right. But that doesn't gain my respect. We, we talked about blue, we talked about red and yellow. Let's talk about white. Yeah. Captain America was hard for you. Yeah. Let's talk about that. And why, why was that? Yes. Some of it was personal. I had some health issues. I thought we'd kind of run up against, Jeff and I had run up against a, a wall of uh, telling sad stories. It was more a straight ahead sad story without much of a story around it. I mean, the, yeah, the Howlers were behind enemy lines before the U.S. was involved in the conflict invading Germany. Well, let me put it this, this way. Everything I hated about Stranko's Rick and Cap, Jeff did to the nth degree. Because <laughs> Jeff liked that. Well, Jeff had just lost his son. I see. To oh. Cancer. Cap did lose Buffy. I mean, Bucky. Buffy. That would have been great. <laughs> That's a great episode. Let's do that. Let's yeah. write that one. Yeah, okay. Um, Spike, what are you doing here? <laughs> I'm, I'm sending you a script tomorrow. I'm sending you the script. <laughs> <laughs> From my perspective, Jeff overwrote the series, and he hit the nail on every head I didn't want to have hit, which was the cap. Rick tortured the Buckies, died. I, I'm responsible for it. Right. Which is the Stan Lee version of, I mean, like, that's well, how it, you... It, According to Strago, he wrote all that stuff. But yeah, that's the version that were the 110 through 113. And I, I think he, at different times, he would have found a different way to tell it a little bit differently that wouldn't hit that nail on the head quite so hard. And eventually through it, and look, I was going through my own stuff in, in various different ways. I was moving, pulling out of love and then into love. And Oh, you were? Yeah, and I had some health issues around that time. Really, the delays, I was unprofessional. I see. But the, I'm just talking about the reasons that it was hard to be professional. Right, right, right. Well, was that kind of a midlife crisis kind of thing? For me? Yeah. No. Okay. No, I, I went through that. Before? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we, we do that earlier. I see, um, I see. <laughs> And so the, by the time we got when, and I kind of lost a little bit of perspective on things, because we'd done ridiculous shit before and I was okay with it, but there was a time in issue six where Cap has to ride a motorcycle up the Eiffel Tower, all the way to the top to defeat the Red Skull. And I you just can't went, actually do what that. are you, no, you can't actually do that. And, and I said, what you, you're such a lazy motherfucker. What are you, what are you doing? Who, Jeff? Jeff was? Yeah. But it really works, turns out. Right, as Nobody far as on cares. the page. Sure. Nobody cares. No one's questioning that stuff. So, the delay in Cap White ultimately is on me. 
It's not our job. There's did, just reasons why. It did it hurt y'all's out. relationship? It did. I see. So that did hurt A you lot. and Jeff's relationship. Has it, has it fixed? It's fixing. Okay, so that was the, the last project of those four colors. The good news is that within the last year, Jeff and I have reconnected. Okay, I see. And talked and gotten along. And he's here at the show, and I was trying to get together with him. But I didn't know he's here until today. Uh huh. So I don't think it's going to happen. But Ian and I got together for lunch at his place last year in Beverly Hills. Uh huh. Great house. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he works in TV, sure. Seriously. Well, but that's the point that he doesn't do comics. He doesn't, he doesn't write for TV. His contract says he can't. And he's working towards. Uh, retirement. He wants to make a nut where he can just live the life that he wants to live and say, see and, and not work. And yeah. Say, see you. That sounds pretty cool. And then maybe write some, write some stuff. Because, some of us need that. <laughs> because I think he, he wants to write. I think he misses writing. And when we had lunch last year, we talked about some stuff and, you know, maybe this, maybe that. But it was all nebulous and don't really know. But that was a lot more than we'd had for a long time before that. Right. Um, was that because you guys talked about it or because which, you didn't talk about it? Like with Captain America, did you publicly say, I wasn't comfortable with this and that made him upset? Um, or because you didn't talk about it as enough? far as I, As far as I know... I mean, Jeff reached out to me and said he saw something online on sci-fi. Yeah. I think probably in New York a, a year ago, in which I made a couple on Cap White. And he called it out of the blue. And then when we, when we had lunch at his house, it was the first time I had heard him say, you know, when I can make my nut and this is over, I got some ideas about what we might want to do. And then we talked about realistically, do you think you could do this anymore? Do you think you can, you know, do a book a month or something? Uh, do you think you can write a book a month? Do you, think- you were saying that? No, he was. He was, he was saying that. Oh, okay. Then, fair question. And I said, I think so. I know I can do, maybe I can't do the schedule part of it, but I know I can do the art. I mean, I haven't, I think I'm drawing as well as I, maybe not quite as well as I once was, but but that's a part of, like in Dark Victory, I was very clear that because I come off of the schedule of Superman for All Seasons and then went right into pencil and inking Batman again with the history of Long Halloween, that drawing every day made me better. So there's that part of it. But I had to want to draw, right? And I wanted to draw. And so, you know, it's it's, look, it's a fair question. And I said, like, I think so. Let's see what we got. And that's what where we left it. So it's in the, pr- it's in the process, like you said. Yeah. It's, I mean, first of all, it had, he has to end with his, the, his own TV. Stuff. And right. The TV stuff. stuff. I hope it does. Cause there's something about you guys working and like, yeah, it's a great team. I want to go through the people that you like, and I want to know why. So you like Alex Toth a lot. Toth. Why? What is it that you like? And I love him. Maybe my favorite. Well, why do you like him? It's not going to be a surprising answer. Because you love his temperament. He's, yeah. 
This <laughs> sweet guy, you believe? <laughs> this makes you feel good. Yeah. Um, he distills things down to its minimum. Right. That's the kind of, that's a lot of people say that about him. Um, Is it a panel or a story tell like panel to panel? That's the thing I'm interested in. Like it's it's more a panel for me. I, I think, for instance, here's something breaking news. <laughs> White devil, devil, yellow devil. Yes. So what it is? Yeah. So good. Chiarello thinks that's the perfect story. But I challenge you to look at the last page and not get the flaw in the storytelling. The last panel is our hero, the white guy. Bent over backwards, his knees under his legs under him. Right. Like he's been shot in the front, but he's been shot in the back. He'd be on his face. That is not good storytelling. Kirsten would have caught that, wouldn't he? Like an uh, easy He would have drawn it first and it said Top that mother. He wouldn't have, yeah. 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 He would never have let that happen. Anyway, so... That's interesting. So that Alice could make those kind of flaws and you'd still forgive it and because the rest of it was so brilliant. I'm not a big fan of his storytelling or his stories that he wrote. Right, right. But his storytelling, when Archie wrote stuff for him, for instance, is absolutely... I have a page from uh, Skyhawk. Oh, cool. Which is two up and dual shade paper airplanes over the fields in Germany. And just terrific stuff. I'm scared to show it because I don't want to bring dual shade out into the light you know, or anything, but I probably will anyways. <laughs> so as far as Toth goes... He has so many different genres where he's so interesting to look at what he's interested in. Romance stuff, Hot Wheels. Who the fuck would Man, care about Hot Wheels? just killer. And yet they're, yeah, I mean, Hot Wheels? Right. You can't do that. But the romance stuff would be my, and the war stuff would be my top stuff that I would want from him. In the horror stuff, I guess, too. It's the geometry of it, which is always what it is for me. I can tell you one thing. I think he's a terrible superhero yeah. artist. That Black Canary some, story some that Some Black did? Canary stuff, yeah, some Black Canary stuff. But Batman, terrible. Uh, Superman, terrible. Oh, yeah, that's awful. But that Batman, Haunted Sky story, you didn't like that too much? With the fighter plane in it and no. his cape with the title on the title page. Not too much. It was trying. Yeah, especially that title page. He was trying for sure. And I think he liked drawing planes too. Oh, he's best. Best planes guy. And you, you think that too, right? Why do you think I have a Skyhawk page? Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> Why do you like Neil Adams? At some point... He knew he was better than anybody else around him. Right. Any genre, anywhere. Yeah. And in multiple mediums, not just comics. I mean, advertising and other things. Right. He stood Stood out. Kind of layout was often distracting needlessly. Yes. And that hurt his storytelling. His storytelling was much better when he worked with Denny O'Neill, although I don't like those stories very much. Oh, interesting. Are you talking the Green Lantern or the Batman stuff? Or Batman. Okay. But especially in the main title, there were some uh, sort of odd one-offs on Detective or something that he would do with, you know, what's the one with the... Ten Eyes? Bit, no, the beckoning uh, hand through the, the open doorway. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. Right. There's variations on that that he did. Did you like his Dead Man? I did. Yeah, those are cool. They were like a stepping stone along the way to him getting better. And experimentally, 
Mm-hmm. As a kid, I was really enthralled with Bork. You can't hurt Bork. Oh, yeah. yeah. Bork can hurt you. <laughs> That's a good one. I like that story. Well, you know, they showed Bork in the recent TV shows. He was in it for like five minutes and oh, his flash. name was Bork. But it was just cool that they, they mentioned him for those yeah. few minutes. Yeah. Those Aquaman ones, I mean, those uh, Brave and Bold ones are, are really fun. That Sergeant yeah. Rock one? Yeah. Again, as a Marvel guy, I didn't really, you know, the fact that I knew Bork was, is amazing to me. Yeah, it's almost random that you knew that um, one. But I do like that story, too. Because he felt more unstoppable than Juggernaut did in that Alex Toth right. issue. Right. Like, I almost felt like Bork, I was more overwhelmed as a reader. I was like, whoa, this guy's, like, strong. He's going to punch his way out of prison. Yeah. You know? I don't care what it feels like. It doesn't feel like anything. <laughs> yeah. Well, again, going back to the comment that Toth can't do, superheroes aren't. Right. But also, so Jug- like, Juggernaut but that, isn't his right. real house. But at the same time, it's not fair, right? Because he was like, had to draw over Kirby's layouts. And it's like a, just a bad fit. And anyway. then Kirby drew. Right. Things, so. Yeah. But I mean, even then, that Bork issue, like you said, I read it. I'm like, okay, this is just some douchebag little guy Batman's going to fight. Right. And, I'm like, and the more I read the panels, I was like getting a sense of dread as I was reading those pages. Right. It's weird. Usually stories don't affect me like that. Well, it affected me. And yeah. I was probably, you know, 12 or something. Yeah, you read it fresh. And yeah. you, weren't, you weren't born. I wasn't born. Yeah, I read it as, a, as an adult much later. Yeah. By the time we got to the Joker's five-way revenge... Yep. That made a difference. But there were also, you know, before that... Here's a good segue to a, a question a, a bit off topic in terms of cover artists. Because, as I mentioned, you and Dave Johnson and a few others are like some of my favorite cover artists. And I think you escaped the thing that I saw happen with other ones, specifically Gil Kane, Neil Adams, and Nick Hardy, where they were really on top of their game in terms of interior stuff. And when they became the primary cover artist for DC or Marvel in the case of Kane, they really seemed to lose something uh, and became almost hackish. And I didn't see that ever happen with you when you were doing a lot of covers. But what do you feel about that in terms of covers versus interior artists? And those people, where they just seem to like become something else as they keep doing well, covers. Well, uh, first of all, I think they were doing a lot more covers than I've ever ever done. did. Yes, and that just grinds you down. And Dave has one of those imaginations that is untiring, and he'll just come up with something out of the blue, out of his ass. He's a design guy. And that like just, yes, but, but it'll be, you know, I'll turn around and he's doing Nick Fury singing a song to a diner, a 50 diner that he's described and just as a $500 commission with the, you know, giant logos and he's lettering it all and he just, he can't stop. I'm not that guy. No, um, but you're your Batman and his Batman. That sequence between the two of you when you you guys were doing the covers were the best Batman covers I've ever seen. You know what I'm talking. When, about? when Dave emphasizes design, there's no way better. No, he doesn't draw terrifically. He no. draws okay. But when he designs it, those Punisher covers? Oh, yeah. Unbelievable. Is uh, Stranko not much of an influence <laughs> on you? No, I mean, we're so different in that way, but I learned a lot from him. Right, right. In my opinion, he's a much better designer than he is a drawer. I mean, his anatomy, anatomy and poses can be wonky and stiff. Every once in a while, they'll be great. But his design is always interesting. It is. It's always, it's always and tough. And it's very distinctively him, too. So he doesn't reach outside of his comfort zone that way. The importance to him in the 1960s in comic books is 
astounding, you know, and that's what I'm responding to. That makes sense. What about Jabushima? Why do you list him as one of your favorites, and, and what is it about him? Anatomy. Oh, yeah, because that's it, isn't it? With the power of the body. Yeah, that's his main thing. And he was always better when he reached outside of that, and he mostly did that with the surfer. That he, he played with design a little bit more, panel layout a little bit more. Do you think he was a good storyteller? Oh, sure. In the old school sense, you should be able to follow it without words. Strength would be hopeless that way, for instance. A lot of people, Adams would sometimes be good that way and otherwise not that, that way. Even at his most experimental, Buscema was a solid storyteller. Was Sal Bushima a solid storyteller? Sure. Yeah. I mean, they boring both... Boring Boring, but he knew how to tell a story. Sure. John so, knew how so to do he, it. he made a living on that. The same way that, I don't know, Herb Trimpey would or a lot of other just workmen, people who could turn out the pages. And if you were given a, a right at the right inker... Boy, it was actually really... It would certainly help, you know. That John Severin, her Trimpe stuff is really good. Severin and John uh, and Marie. Yeah. He would help them. But they were transforming something pedestrian into enhanced pedestrian. They weren't really breaking any ground or... And, you know, I guess you could say the same thing about Ramita, but he just drew so beautifully. You know, it was just pretty. Everything was pretty. Yeah. And then when I tried to imitate him on uh, Spider-Man Blue, Petey is dreamy. Who wouldn't want to fuck Petey? Right. Everyone does. Jim does. No. No? no. Six-pack? I mean, he has six-pack. Mm-hmm. I'm sure. I'm gonna imagine. I would fuck the Ditko PD first. Oh, right. you kind of like but, the. Oh, I would fuck the Ditko Gwyn in a second. That bitch. Yeah. Well, <laughs> that's that's my own. Yeah. The, the little barrettes and yeah, shit. Yeah, and it's just a me thing. Oh man. Okay. Yeah. No, the Ditko Gwen. No, I, it's a Veronica. Ditko totally. Gwen was a fucking. Bitch. Yeah, you're right. She was mean. Her. Veronica. She was awful. She had a Veronica like thing that. Oh, I see. Just. Kills it for me. But when you say Ditko Pete, you like kind of that nerdy anxiety, like social anxiety type. I like everything about Ditko Pete. Squarehead. Yeah. Squarehead, yeah. Yeah. Right. A high school tie to... And somewhat conservative. Is hates it? protesters. You like that. That well, turned you on? No, it's not that part. <laughs> it's- it, was a, it, was a it was a tie to high school. Slacks creased, double creased. Right. So no, wait a minute, wait a minute. He's no, in high school. You wanna you wanna make a high school boy? High school. No. All right, let I'm, me let me just I'm make taking clear. notes, no, buddy. Let me make clear <laughs> that what I'm saying is that the the Peter Parker of the Romita era right. could get girls. He yeah. was cool. And I don't like that. Oh, My really? Peter Parker is me. Mm. And we get beat the shit out of by Flash Thompson. No, we I get see, tied I see. by you, a pole. We are not right. the we we are the undercover mm-hmm. cool guys. Right. But no one recognizes No, him. I know what you're saying. Romita Pete is he's got a bike. He's got girls. He's getting laid. It's Good a thing. It's a lame bike. Though. Yeah, I, I know what you're saying. But you know what? I grew up on Romita Spider Man and Ron Friends Spider Man. And I did love <laughs> Ramita Spider-Man. <laughs> Dickos came later, and I didn't like it in the beginning because I imprinted on Ramita Spider-Man as a kid. But that being said, later on, I appreciate it. And it's certainly more creative. But I love Ramita's, like, romance comic you approach. You grew up on the Ramita Spider-Man. Me, I did, because I read no. reprints. Yes. yes, reprints. But you grew up on 
And no one says this. And no, no I'll one, tell you what. No one I grew ever up on, says, I grew up, on, I grew up on Ross Andrew. No, no, no. No one I, ever says no, no, no. that. I grew up on Spider-Man and his amazing friends, and that aesthetic was based on the Ramita stuff. <laughs> right. But whoever says, I grew up on Ross Andrew, Spider-Man. <laughs> nobody. Nobody. Because nobody did. <laughs> but, 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 but it's very combat. <laughs> but that is awesome. Yes. Because nobody, <laughs> nobody people, cared. You're right. Yeah. So let's leave it at that. If there's anyone that I uh, bang in comments, <laughs> they're over the age of 18. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> Not you too, though. <laughs> Not you too. <laughs> Nick, Nick Carney Wonder Girl. Like, Nick Carney Wonder Girl like, is under 18. Her. I'm just saying. <laughs> Because that's a repeated pattern, I'm just yeah, saying. Yeah, but yeah. that doesn't matter. We're let's, all friends. Let's, let's move on. <laughs> let's talk about Ross Andrew for a second. Why don't you like Wonder Woman? Not just Ross Andrew Wonder Woman, but... Especially Ross Andrew. Yeah, because that's awful. She doesn't have an interesting backstory. She rides kangaroos. Not interesting. Yeah, I don't find the kangaroo aspect interesting. I like the Greek myth stuff, but... I don't... Yeah, you're not into Greek mythology then. Not in comics. Not in comics. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Yeah, I think you have to kind of like the Greek myth stuff to like Wonder Woman, I think. <laughs> and according to John Byrne, she has a Greek accent. I don't care what John so, Byrne says. What, as, a, as a comic book artist and auteur, what is your feeling about John Byrne? He's asked about Neil Adams and a few others. John, John Byrne. Et al. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I was et asking et about ones he admired. Right, right. But I want to hear about, you know, because Jobber did a lot of comics in the 80s, right? In the late 70s. What's your impression of those comics? I can live with that. Right, okay. Easily. Easily. Okay. Like not pioneering, you would say. Well, I guess pioneering, but pioneering towards something I'm still not interested. I see. All right. That's fair. I mean, Dave Cockrum. Dave Cockrum, yeah. But I could care less about what he created. Oh, I see. And okay. it's a billion dollar industry. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Sure, sure, sure. Claremont, same thing. Yeah, okay. Is there any Marvel icon? Because I know out of your, like, three, it's Batman, Superman, and and then Spider-Man. I was surprised that Captain America wasn't as, I mean, like, you put him in second tier. Yeah. What about Doctor Strange? Would you like to do Doctor Strange? I still don't have a emotional hook on. But Doom, you do. What about Fantastic Four? Uh, group books, I just done that. You haven't done any, have you? Well, the Challengers is a well, group yeah, book. but but boy, that's and they were the only the FF were the only group that I read. I never cared about the Avengers. Or defenders, <laughs> anything like that. So even as a consumer, you didn't like the group books that much. Yeah, they all seemed like, well, we can interchange any of these people at any time we want. Well, Cap's not here anymore. Let's get Wasp. Not unique, and they can actually interchange the same lines to different people. It wouldn't make a difference. Is there any any writer currently where you would just say, I'll do what, like, Tom King is awesome. Yeah. I mean, we, and we all agree about that. If he mm-hmm. said, I want you to do Avengers with me, or you, I want you to do a Group Vision book? Part 2, would Group you? Book? Yeah. I'd say, why? Why you? Sell it to me. Uh, what makes you come to me about this? That's uh, great. You want to know why you're doing it. Yeah, I mean... Yeah, because you've worked at it long enough. People know your style. So if they're coming at you, clearly they saw something they want. Unless some editor said, you know, go to Tim. Um, so if it's a smart editor that figures out that that's a good match, you if it's someone it's you respect... a terrible match, so he's not a good editor. Right. Okay, next question. You did one Spectre cover. It was a Joker cover. Ryan Sook was doing... Like this killer run of Spectre covers. Mm. And there was a special event where the Joker took over the whole universe or something. And so you did a Spectre cover that where the Spectre looked like the Joker. Oh, that was the Joker month. Yeah, it was Joker month. Yeah, no, those are terrible covers. I hated them. 
that's what I was wondering because Sook had he's very good and he did this run. He is. Yeah, he's, his commandy was. Oh, that commandy thing terrific. that he. Did. Would you have liked to have done one of those? Yeah, Mark approached me. I was curious about that. Well, if you look at the collection, Mark took some of my work, cut it up as an example of what a page should be. We're talking about the Wednesday comics. In the introduction to the book. And this is what he put in front of D.C., saying this is what it should be. And it was my work that I'd already done, and he just cut it up and arranged it differently. But I was under contract to Marvel. Ah, because that was such in your wheelhouse, you would have been great for that. And that's why I will never be under contract again. Right, it's limiting. Because of that specific thing? That's Well, that no, that and other things, but... Yeah, because yeah, there's a time when he couldn't do something with Jeff Lowe because of that, of a contract at DC. Confidential, I couldn't go to work with Jeff because they had to end my contract with DC with Superman Confidential. That was one of the best things that Chiarello did was that, that, that yeah. Wednesday Comics. Wednesday. I mean, that was Terrific. totally brilliant. And like half of those were beyond good. I mean, like just fantastic. I know. He is a free of. These great ideas that fail. Yep. They fail, not artistically, but maybe not commercially. Gloriously, but they still fail. Yeah. You and I talked about Dave Johnson and you. What other cover artists? And what's the difference between an interior artist and a cover artist in terms of when you're approaching something? What makes a great cover artist? Well, let's take Dave for example. He can draw, but he's not a great figure artist. He's a great designer. And he can make the figures work within his great design. But when it's panel after panel, it just shows up the flaws in his ideas or his compositions. Because you have to find a way to make the mundane interesting. I just don't think that's where his strength is or his interest is. But give me a design to do, a character to exemplify in one image, or a storytelling point in one image. He's so good. Frank Avella. Right? God, that guy. He's kind of in mystery. But when he hits, it's when he hits, really he's, great. I think of him as a cover artist. Oh yeah, he's he's not a very good panel of pen guy. But his covers, when they're right, absolutely, just are great. Yeah, yeah. There's a few out there that like they're so good at that. Chris Semney. Yeah, we can talk about some of the Vertigo titles where <laughs> they were always better. And the covers. Well, yeah. I mean, they're the, the Jay Lees of the world or the... What do you think about Alex Ross? I think Alex Ross has hurt <laughs> comics more than he's helped comics in a lot of ways. As much as I like some of the things he's done, I like Kingdom Come, but I think there's a stiffness to what he did that, in general that I think his people have emulated. Not Tarantino, but the emulators of it that can't do it as well, like really made sucky movies. Alex Ross is good at what he does, but the people that do Alex Ross aren't very good. And even Alex Ross, after a certain point, it's like he's just copying. He's, I don't love him. No, he's lifeless. I think he's important to <coughs> Astro City, and I love Astro <coughs> City. Covers are a collaboration with, with everybody else, and I think those are good. But overall, no, I think I don't like Alex Ross to some degree. But I mean, isn't that how the art of illustration is in general? It's somewhat lifeless and anatomical. The difference from cartooning in general? No. Okay, so what would be an example of illustration that doesn't do that? Rockwell. Okay, true. Yeah, all right. Go be with more. All right, yeah, I guess I, I'm imagining some Rockwell pictures, and there does seem like a life like they're actually living in those pictures. Okay, and then in the Alex Ross ones... Maybe it's the eyes. Stiff. They all use photography. 
Yes, they do. That's not the point. As reference, yeah. But Ross is slave to it in a different way. Um, and that is meant to be impressive and is impressed, has impressed thousands of people. And I can't fucking stand it. Interesting. Yeah, that's like that Sandblom guy with his Coca-Cola commercials. There is a life in those pictures that I guess with the Alex Ross, you just maybe don't see that. I will give you... Okay. It's the eyes. Hey. Isn't, it, isn't it the eyes? No. no I, I, more Mexican is an example. There is, you look at a vigilante issue where you look at a Johnny Quick... That's not lifeless. That is full of yeah, like, but, like but, joy. I but mean, I wouldn't consider that like an illustration approach to the pictures. But we're talking yeah. about comics, right? Right. But I mean, I think that's in the cartooning world. Personally. But I, I don't. I think your point of isn't cartooning inherently lifeless? No, no, no. Illustration. No, I don't no. agree with that at all. All right. Like okay. Like for example, Hal Foster, Prince Valiant. You know, let's say like for, in, the, in the in the later forties. It felt like mannequins, but they looked really nice. No, it's pretty lifeless. Yes. And that was like an illustration aspect of it. But um, Hal Foster's never my guy. Right. I'm just saying that as an example of illustration versus, let's say, cartooning like Kirby, which is like all this foreshortening and everything's bouncy and punchy. You know, it's different. Well, yeah, it's different. But that doesn't mean... That all illustration is lifeless, right? Yes. Right. That, I get that. Frank McCarthy. Okay. Check him out. Look him up. Yeah, so this doesn't show eyes, but it does feel like it's alive as he's riding that horse. Yeah. Yeah. There's so much more you, you, to McCarthy, too. I guess I see. It's not just eyes, right? There's a body language and... Uh, it's movement. Energy. Yeah, there's a movement and energy. Energy to the movement, yeah. Yeah, I Well, see. you know it's real or where you know it's like Lark? Alex Ross is almost like it's like they're all like kind of standing. Death. All right, point taken. Look up Robert McGinnis. And that feels like a person. Yeah. But that's photographed. Yeah, they feel like people. Fuck yeah, that does. Look at that painting. How great is that? Yeah. yeah. That you don't see in an Alex Ross type. Oh, thing. you never get... I don't get any personality. Okay. At your current age, in what ways are you a better artist? And in what ways is it harder for you now? Harder for me to get up in the day and imagine drawing... And making two pages, not a day, but in two days. Right. The energy that it takes to put that in. there, You feel like there's less energy. Yeah. Okay. Is your hand control as good as it was? Not quite. But I think that, I hope, that is due to not getting up every day and drawing a page and a half. I think that was a real turning point. And I mentioned this earlier with Dark Victory. I think that was a big deal, doing that day after day. And the invaluable part that Mark Chiarello played in our friendship and his, his knowledge of illustration and illustrators in just calling and sharing stuff with me. I think about it now, and it's just ridiculous. He would call and talk for me th- for three hours in the middle of the day. I said, Mark, you know you're my boss, and you're just wasting my fucking time. Or I'm not drawing that when you say wasting my time, because it wasn't. It was invaluable. But the grind is harder. I think I'm comparable to my hand coordination and with the brush. My sense of design would get better if I was doing more work constantly. But I think it's still... There, I can feel it in my compositions when I'm I'm drawing for people at guns and at home. That's encouraging. We've been talking about the influence of Mark Chiarello and and how on the Marvel side, let's talk about John Rochelle for mm-hmm. a minute. It seems like he that and and Chip Kid these are design geniuses. Talk yeah. about this for a minute. Well, uh, John is not with Marvel, neither is Chip Kid, but John works with Richard on Comic Craft, and Richard has always called him the secret weapon of Comic Craft, just because he's kind of an idiot savant with 
fonts and with design. And the only reason not to employ them is that they don't come cheap. And if you have your in-house designers that are okay, so let's go with them. But if you want it to really look good, you go to John. I mean, what has he done with you? Certainly everything since the Marvel color books. He and Richard have put together the package when it when it's going to be collected. So, what are the end papers? What are the what's the title page going to look like? What are the extras going to look like? That kind of thing. And that, you know, that may seem like a trivial thing, but it all matters to the end result. You'd notice it if it looked like shit. Yeah. And it doesn't look like shit. And that's just a matter of placing things on the page and choosing what to have there and what can what we don't need, what we do need. These are all the extras that we have, and then let me play with it, and um, they're not going to all get in there. So there are, that kind of he's thing. an example of an unsung hero that people don't understand. Yes, absolutely is. But you understand. How yeah, and, and Richard is very protective of him because of that. But the, you know, the sad thing is that the other professionals don't appreciate it. I don't quite get that, but it's true. That they'll say, anything is okay. Just knock it out, and as long as I get paid... So there's kind of no legacy to it. And Richard and John are, you know, all about the... Given them on their own whims, they will change things at the last second because they know printing, it's not too late. And... Publishers will go, no, sorry. You know, that went out last week. Last week? Well, then we got a week to go. So that kind of thing, that, that's a, it's invaluable. And that's, that's what Jeff used to get into so many fights about at Marvel and DC, saying, you know, no, that's bullshit. There is time. As long as you can get that thing to stand up straight. So from day one of your career to the present, Design is a key aspect. Yeah, sure. And I think that's why I respect your work so much, because you're always aware of the design of it, not just the everything else. You're aware of the storytelling, you're aware of the panel, but design of it, and those are the people you are drawn to as well. Yeah, right down to book management. And we haven't talked about Solo, but I designed Solo with Mark, or I designed my issue. And he was open to other people working different ways. But that entire layout, I worked out meticulously with Mark. For everyone's? I mean, in no, terms for, of... for me. For yours. For mine. And yours was the first, issue yeah. one. Yeah. So, turn the page and there's this. That kind of thing. There are no ads, so you could do that. Did each artist do that? Have the same? I don't know. You don't know? I would doubt it. I think Richard Corbin wasn't interested probably in getting into that minutia. But I don't know. Cooks is brilliant. Yes. The other book was Dark Victory and the collection. And I designed that. And again, kind of page by page, we were going to end on this page and begin this you know, or title pages here. And I insisted on title pages. And Robin Brosterman was the uh, book editor, designer, at the time. And I, I remember calling and congratulating her on the book. And she said, I did nothing. You fucking did it. Hmm. With a little bit of resentment. Like you took away my job or oh, okay. something like that. Yeah. 
Yeah, but I'm better than you, Robin. So. <laughs> and there you go. Or you never would have got it if I just tried to describe it to you. So I just did it. I'm a print of yours of the cat woman with her head cut off and the mirror image where you can see her head. Kitty. Yeah. Hanging in my living room. I have taken that to class. I've taught with it. I've used that from a film theory standpoint. It means a lot. It's, it's very useful. When you did that, what were you thinking when you cut off her head at the top and well, then did it as the mirror image where you actually get to see her? That's uh, inspired by Rene Gro, G-R-U-A-U, who inspired all my Catwoman covers. He signed every piece he did with an asterisk and a G underneath. And so I put an asterisk on every cover I did and on your print. And then my name underneath it as a tip of the hat. He just, he was a fashion illustrator, a French fashion illustrator from the 30s through the 80s, probably. And he would do shit like that. And his most famous stuff was like a woman with a, with a hat and the hat would swoop down over part of it. Oh, sure. Yeah. So that was kind of a trope that he would do. And so that doing the reverse image, I, I'd done so much stuff working on Catwoman, and I did that print, that arc for the print, uh, right at the end of my Catwoman run. And I was just still in it. And I just thought, you know, reverse it. Chirello colored that, by the way. Oh, it's beautifully colored. It's one of my favorite things you ever did. And I have it in my Thank living you. room. But, but I, I love that piece. I, I hope you like it. Because oh, I love it. Yeah. I have it up, too. I think it works as an illustration. It's more an illustration than a comic book. I didn't draw the cat all that well, but we'll let that go. All right. I can't say how much fun this has been for me. We enjoyed it very much. This has been a riveting interview with Tim Sale here at the Comic Book Historian Podcast. I'm Alex Grand with my co-host, Jim Thompson. Tim, thank you so much for doing this with us here at WonderCon. This has been a really fun and exciting interview for us. Well, thank you guys. It's An important one, my I pleasure. think. It's, it's, I've listened to a bunch of yours. I'm very happy with this one. <laughs> Good. Cheers, everybody. Yeah.